Do you remember when we were like really clever about starting podcasts? Oh, and you'd be like, oh, who's going to be the guy who has the clever thing to say? <laughs> <laughs> How's it going to happen? It was way easier when we were just talking. I would just never know when you hit record. Right. But now that right. I know that you've hit record. It's almost a little intimidating, isn't it? Like, like you hit record, so like you have to be on. Like you have to like present and you have to entertain. Maybe I, no, no. No? I, I, I guess it hasn't, I think it's because I worked a full day. Fair, yeah. I don't really, I'm not very entertaining. Now. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> well, I mean, our, our old podcast used to be on Sunday nights, so it was more like, hey, something I get to look forward to. Maybe I did some yard work, maybe I did some house shit or some homework or whatever, but then I get to mellow out before the week begins. Was it on Sundays? Yeah, it was always on a Sunday. Man, I was drinking a lot. <laughs> Holy smokes. I was drinking on Sundays? Yeah, whatever. That's fine. I didn't have a car at the time, so. That's true. That's true. So I wasn't driving. But like, you live like next to everything. Not for, not, not for all of them. No. No, I was living really far oh, away. Oh, you were living those like bungalow things. Yeah. Yeah, I remember those. But uh, That's true. Yeah. Welcome to our amazing podcast. Our amazing new <laughs> podcast that we're doing. <laughs> Bringing value to the communities where two fat guys talk about something interesting that we find interesting that our wives don't. Uh, yeah. I think we just found our tagline. Yep. Welcome to Buttertown. <laughs> <laughs> Buttertown. That's way better. I love it. I love it. Buttertown works. Buttertown. What was it supposed to be? Butter Capital. Yeah, Buttertown is way funny. Buttertown is way, way welcome funnier. to Buttertown. It's like welcome to Flavor Town, but you know, <laughs> with butter. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta start the uh, podcast off right. There we oh, go. Oh yeah, I'm gonna. This is the first full sugar pop I've had since the last Dr Pepper with uh, strawberries and cream that I had like three months ago. These are fucking gross. These are legitimately terrible. Are they? Uh, no, no, they're, they're they're not as bad as what was the one they did right before this? Uh, they did some flavor right before this that was like, oh, yep, I never want to drink that again. And I literally had a, an eleven pack sitting in my fridge for about a year. Uh, but this isn't terrible. Do you want to take? A, you want to try it? I do actually. Yeah, because uh, I like strawberries and cream. Yeah, it's it's truly not terrible. It's just it's a lot of sugar. Like I'm not used to the sugar in in, in anymore. That ain't bad. Yeah. They came out with a, a vanilla like was good. four years ago. I did like the vanilla. It was only around for summer, and then it went away. Yeah, I remember that. I was so pissed about that because it was so good. You know, but they didn't come out with a diet, so I didn't like stock up on it. Dr. Pepper is my favorite thing to mix with whiskey. You've told me that before. Super good. Why? Uh, there was a guy that I was in the military with that, that did it, and he just and he was very Irish. He liked Jameson, and he liked Dr. Pepper, and he kind of made that baby, and I stole that baby. Aww. <laughs> and I, or I drank that baby. Oh, that's so. even worse. <laughs> yeah. So, like, have you ever had a flaming Dr. Pepper? I have not. You've told me about it. Yeah. It's, it's surprisingly good. Uh, bars won't usually make it, you know, because of fire, but... Oh, yeah. I'm like, I see all the... The people who are who doing shots of mm, things that mm. they all the all the fire shots and like they try and put it out and everything and all they do is just spit fire everywhere. Oh, my oh God. I haven't seen oh, that. There's there is like a whole genre of YouTube video of people just spitting out flaming shots of things, and I've just nope, no thank Oh you. my god, I, I want nothing want to, do to do with that. No. Like those days are so long behind like I, I I never was the big drinker. I never was the uh like the the person to go out partying. Like I maybe had like a, a month span. Where I did that, and then I woke up one day and I was like, "Man, this shit's tiring. I gotta check a shit to do." What month was that? <laughs> it was a month that you did that. It was like it was like right after I turned twenty one. I had this like little mentality of like, "Oh, everyone wants to drink. Everyone should drink. So I'm gonna go out and drink." And I did it for honestly maybe like five or six nights. And I'm like, "I'm I'm good. I'm good. This is fine." So I mean. If I don't drink booze, I'm fine. Mm. Like I, if I never drink like whiskey or anything again, like I don't care. But like, beer is super awesome, and we're in this like really cool, like golden age of of like craft beer that's oh, going on right that's now. That's true. Yeah. But I, so like you know, there's so many things to try. There's so many 
places you could go and breweries, like the food that goes along mm-hmm, with that. Because mm-hmm. you can't just have a brewery. You got to have your brewery and like what food tastes good with your beer. Yeah. And so like it's a whole thing and it's super cool. Where I'm going with this, it's like people are parents' age. Like the people who decided to be alcoholics and things like that, they were just <laughs> like, well, Budweiser is the way to go. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, uh, got to drink all that, all the hams I can. <laughs> I like there's all of this wonderful beer. Like all they had was just like six, six crap options. Right, right. And that was it. And literally they, uh, again, this is coming from someone who doesn't drink that much, but they literally all taste the same. That's no. <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> I will say hams is far Far worse. Hams is, is awful. That is, my, <laughs> it is that really is the most hated of the old man beers. There's <laughs> there's some that I've had that I like. I actually I don't mind Schlitz. I don't okay. mind PBR. PBR um, is such like a hipster thing. It's like yeah, but it, I, this I, one I tastes like good. shit, so I'm going to drink it. See, with those beers, like if they are not cold, mm. they, uh, it is really gross. And I will say, hot day, sweating, working outside, ice. Cold shit beer is amazingly good because it's watered like, down. Yeah, like a Miller Light, it's yes. it, it's good enough to go. Man, that's really nice, but I need to drink this really fast. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's gonna taste like the the end of a pop popsicle. Yeah, yeah, you know where that end? You're just like licking wood, and you're like, ugh. Yeah, yeah. Well, after somebody peed on it, I mean, that's <laughs> that's accurate. Yeah, piss piss coated. Popsicle Ugh. stick. Mm. What and was your popsicle stick? What, what the popsicle stick? What was your popsicle stick of choice? What was your popsicle of, of choice when you were a kid? Okay, so growing up, we didn't have a lot of money. Yeah. So I, all I got was bomb pops. All I got was bomb pops because it was the cheapest one. It was the one that was always. Were they cents. really? Bomb ch- pops was the cheapest one. I love bomb pops. But I always wanted the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle one. The one with the wonky eyes. Oh, I always yeah. wanted that. I always thought that was the greatest one. And I never got it. When I got. When I got older, and yeah, I, yeah, by yeah. older I mean yeah. yesterday, every time I, <laughs> I get, went out to the store, got Teenage Mutant Ninja. I, I was only able to get like a couple Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because I would actually go the to ice cream? the ice cream truck and I would get it. And yeah, I'm yeah. Like, wow, this is really not as good as I thought it would be. <laughs> but you can't get it anymore now because uh, the, <laughs> the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle has been replaced with SpongeBob. Oh, there's no more Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle uh, pop or uh, ice cream. Thing. Is 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 it the same flavor? Do you know? Crap, yeah, like <laughs> just crap sugar. Yeah. Was 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 there like a like like a gumball in it or something? Was there something like special? Yeah, the gumball it? eyes, the gumball eyes. The gumball oh, eyes. okay. So you had the Ninja Turtle gumball eyes, and then you had your SpongeBob gumball eyes. And I don't know. I don't know what the what the next big thing would be. I don't mm. know. I don't know. Baby Shark. Who who, who knows what it'll be? I don't know. That I think Baby Shark was kind of a flash in the pan. Baby Shark is not a flash in the pan. I mean, it's not SpongeBob. SpongeBob is, I mean, you can't go on r slash memes without seeing a thousand different SpongeBob memes. That's true, but that's because the 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 children the, that the, are watching Baby the demographics, Shark now. Right, right, I think right, Baby right. Shark, there's a channel, and these people just make Baby Shark videos. You're kidding. It, they have views in the billions, plural. Yeah. They made so much money. Baby shark, do 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 do, and we can't be monetized now. Yeah, I mean it is. It is a super addictive song. The first time I heard it, I lost my shit. I was like, "Oh, this is actually good." I my I told my wife, she was like, "We have to come up with our own stupid." I was like, "I'll be the big dumb bear, and you be the little dumb bear, and then we can make dumb bear music together." Dude, if you want to do that, I will make that video so fast. Okay. I'm, I'm not not she kidding. Can actually, sing. I would just be the dumb bear. You just told me that I did not know your wife could sing. She can sing, yeah. She's like, what does good. she like to sing? She, uh, she because she has a deeper voice. Mm. Everything she sings sounds amazing. She's like, yes. she's like, she's got that Fiona Apple thing going on. Yeah, that's she's what a, I was she's thinking. A very small person with a deeper voice. So she can she uh, she hates singing it, but she she can sing Bobby McGee. Sounds. I was gonna say Janis Joplin. She can sounds sing. up her alley. Yeah. She uh, she said it hurts her voice, mm, the, the way that she a little has raspy, a little raspy, but uh, uh, she can sing like uh, "Killing Me Softly." So so good. Really. Like, we just go to when we do karaoke. Yeah she's, yeah yeah. She's literally the person who goes up there and everybody stops what they're doing and listens. And I've even had like little old men just walk up to me 
and congratulate me on having a wife that can sing so good. Wow. Yeah. Kind of awkward. It is. It's awesome. I so on our very it was one of our very first dates. She she wanted to go to a place that had care or no, she didn't know there was karaoke there. I was not really big into karaoke. I, I had only sung karaoke like maybe once that I remember. Okay, okay. And she saw that there was karaoke at the place that we went to, and she goes, oh, karaoke, I want to sing. And I remember thinking, like, nobody <laughs> nobody sings karaoke just on a whim. Right, right, right. right this right. will be a thing I do now. That's, ex- that ex- never happens. Except for the whole Japanese population. Except for the whole, no, because they, they, it's like, that is a night out of things happening. Ah, this true, would be this true, is true. This true. is this is the derive. This is the the derive. The, the What's derive, a derive? Is, is it's when when you go out. It's it's where you wander. Anything could happen. It's a it is derive. That's a term. That's that's what that the, means. The you der- just like the derive. You just go do shit. Yeah. There, matter of fact, the the situationists were the ones that came up with the derive. Situationist. What's the a situationist? So you you know Dada. I know Dada. Before Dada, there was a situationist. Okay. Dada based a lot of their stuff off of the situationist. I haven't heard of this. It was a French, it was a French uh, art movement, and people wanted to, they wanted to do something new and interesting, mm. Mm. and they would come up with ways on how to just go on journeys where they weren't in control. Which is what a derive is. Which is what Dada becomes. Yes, yes, yes. So the what they would do is they would they would come and you can get a, a, an app on your phone that is like <gasps> for a derive that literally takes you to places that you would have never gone to otherwise. I love that so much. That is so up my alley. Like uh, uh, when 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 Andy and I go on road trips, our number one rule is oh sorry we have two rules. One, if it looks cool, we're gonna stop. Like if they have a billboard or something and it just uh, it makes us laugh, we're going to stop. The other thing is anywhere we go, we ask, what should we do in this town? And anything people suggest, we will go check it out. Except for one time. Uh-oh. We went to a gas station in the middle of Alabama. <laughs> right there, the you know story ends. But no, uh, he goes, yeah, you know, you got to go down this here road here, and there's an alligator show. We're like, alligator show? I'm, I'm still on Backwoods, board. Alabama? I'm down. I'm, I'm, I'm down. I'm, I'm super I'm down. down. Twice. So we we drive down about four miles. We're feeling real awkward. There's no signs, nothing like that whatsoever. It's starting to feel a little horror movie. And we come up to this 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 driveway of gravel, and there's a guy sitting out front with half of a leg and missing his hand. I don't remember which, which hand it was, but he was Sounds holding... Sounds like he wasn't very good at being a, a, yeah. an alligator trainer or whatever he was. He was holding a wood sign that said gators. So we turned around and left. Oh, no. I, I, I want to see the feeding. <laughs> Did he still have a hand? <laughs> yeah, like, he wasn't gonna. Well, he had one hand holding a sign, and then he had a nub, and then like his jeans were like wrapped up around like the knee. So to me, that was like, oh, Leatherface lives there. Let's not go there. You know what? You know what's going on in my head now? Like that guy, he has these alligators, right? And mm, they were given mm, to him. Mm. They were given to him by his father. P- passed down. Yeah. The, he, Hereditary. This is, this is an alligators that were passed down to him. And the only thing that he can do is to do these shows to pay for it. But if nobody goes, he loves them so much, he's willing to feed himself to those gators so they can keep living. I hate you. So when you turned around, I hate you so much right now. <laughs> he loved, he he loved old aggro that mean son of a bitch and gator so much that he 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 gave up a, a toe at least. Mm. Yeah, I turn around again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still wouldn't go. <laughs> no, eh. whatevs. You look like a fat boy. You're an extra meal. Oh yeah. Anyway, so we are here tonight to talk about what, John? Uh, you, I, you brought a library. I know. So I, I have lots. I, I'm an architectural designer, and I have lots of books because that's a thing that some architects do is they mm. buy books. There is a Japanese word for people who buy books and they don't read them. Um, that's probably partially me. Is it hoarder? Or, I don't know. Japanese have words. The, the Japanese people and, and German people have words for everything. They do have amazing words. Amazing, amazing words. But there is a 
There's a Japanese term for people who just buy books but don't read but them. Buy books but don't read them. I've read. Have you read these? Uh, all of, I have not been able to. These are very dense. I haven't been able to get through all these, of these yet. The, this stack over here. Yeah. Oh, oh well, no. Okay. I, I have read all that one. Oh, I've read that one. one. That's yeah. Scott McCloud, right? Yeah. Or, it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a. I just in case you it's didn't a great, read it. I, was gonna say, I, I love that you brought the kids' book. Are you kidding me? This isn't a kid. I'm just saying, everything else here looks very academic. This one has a comic on it, Jason. Have you read that's, this one? That's this <laughs> whole pile. That this, is the, this is the J pile right here. These are all comics. Say, the, top, the top looks very much uh, like, like, like a noir black and white comic. Like heavy, it, heavy tones. Yes. That's funny. Yes. Okay. So essentially, all I'm doing is... It's a show and tell because nobody else really cares. I love it. I absolutely nobody else love cares, this. and it's yes. like, hey, these are some cool things. And I'll, you know, if the all all three people that listen to this, if there's if you guys are like into any architectural things, um, I highly recommend these books. Man, you are you are really hit, hitting for the the home run there with three watchers. Huh? I know it's a Damn. very tail number. We're going for it. <laughs> so the the first book, and Jay talked about this, is the. Understanding Comics, oh. The Invisible Art by Scott McCloud. Okay, so you say this is a children's book. But no, 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 is... no, 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 no. I, I just meant by color tones yes. only. This uh, is like the, the yes. comic, like how comics are made. This is the, I love this book. It is the, uh, essentially like how the panels are broke down. Yeah. It's all the rules. Page I know for flow, your, for your, flow. for your thesis. For your master's thesis, I'm sure you definitely use this. My as, copy was dog-eared oh, to hell and back. I bet. Yep. This is and this is awesome. Yeah. Um, and I, and I know that you really love comics, mm. as do I. Mm. So I thought that some of the books that I should bring are the architectural comic books. So the first one is the Understanding Comics: The Invisible Art by Scott McCloud. I highly recommend it. Yes. It's all about it. It's uh, just for comics in general. And l let me just put one thing down real quick because in, in case we don't get back to this, um, this book changed the way I looked at comics and it changed the way I looked at film. It literally changed my understanding of art in general uh, with like page flow, how your eyes transfer from one image to the next and like when you take like a graphic design class or, you know, understand anything about graphic design, uh, you understand there's a hierarchy of things and there's a hierarchy in visual media too. And it's, it's captivating mm -hmm. when you can actually break it down. And the thing that, that, that transferred my brain out of my soul into the, the idea that comics are art, not just, you know, comic books and they're fun is uh, gutter. The gutter is essentially the only other type of artistic uh, endeavor in any art form that represents an edit, that re represents a cut of story. Is that the white lines in between? Yeah, it's it's the oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, the gutter oh. is 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 the area between the panels. And when you start getting into more artsy uh, books, artists will use the gutter in more negative space terms for time displacement and location displacement. And um, I know we're talking about like artsy art comics, but like one of my favorite Marvel comics is Gwenpool, where literally her power is to live in the gutters. And it's so surreal and cool. And then when they retconned her, I was like, you, you, you missed the opportunity to tell an amazing story here. And uh, yeah, her power was to like go through panels and live in the gutter space. It was and so it was cool. that way? Yeah. Oh, yeah, like, I love like, like, that. like she would like branch out of panels and then fall into white. It was really cool. So anyway, uh, this book changed everything for me when it came to art. So that's why I did my thesis about that because it, awesome. it just floored everything. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just had to jump in on it. So please. Actually, the, the designer that I work with, uh, he's like, he's, a, he's our head designer. Yeah. Uh, he brought that book up because he was talking about it. And he he's like, I have that on my shelf. I literally was able to like reach over. I was like, you mean because we were on Teams? This book? <laughs> That's baller, man. Uh, you just like pull, pull it up up into frame. Yeah, you mean this one that I'm reading instead of working? <laughs> he did a sequel. Did he? Um, uh, I started reading it, but it was like a little out of what I wanted. I wanted more theoretical stuff, and it didn't feel that way, so I kind of stopped. But that was also when. I was literally done with my thesis <laughs> and I didn't want to read anymore. So maybe I'll go back and uh, I, I'll I revisit that. I never stopped. 
I just kept going. You really did. Man. I just was like, there's, I, for the, like the longest time I just, I felt bad not learning. It's like, why would I, why would I not be learning right now? I get that. It's so when, when you're in grad school, you're constantly around other people who are just inundated with academics, whatever realm of academics that, that, that is, you want to talk about things. You want to discuss things. You want to like theorize things. Just having that kind of like conversation go so far. And when you and I did our, our podcast, it helped me communicate better. It helped me get ideas better. It helped me get quicker with comedy. Um, but it really helped me with my stutter. And I was really impressed about that. Hmm. But when I stopped doing the podcast and when I stopped being in grad school, it just feels like communication goes away. So like I longed for that academic kind of theorizing. And when we stopped doing the podcast, I literally got shitty at communication. I think there's so much of like what I don't think like anybody really prepares you for is how much production has to happen. On a podcast? I didn't know just production of anything. Like somebody always, you there's you always have to sit down and do the work. Oh. And there's no time to true. think. There's no time. Because, you know, the client's not going to pay for you to think about it. Yeah. He wouldn't have hired you if he didn't know how to do it already. That's right. So like the idea of thinking through like these neat ideas are so sparse and they mm, don't get to come mm. by very often. Um, like, you know, so it's, I don't know. And you also have to be with like-minded people that are into that stuff. That's really important. So, which brings me to the which next bring, thing. Yes, transition transitions. <laughs> so, something there's there's a um, uh, Blark Ingalls is the is that a real name? He's I'm probably like saying it awful, but he has a his firm is called Big because it's Blark Ingalls Group. It's called Big. Oh, that's. That's so, so good. He is a he's an award winning architect. As a matter of fact, he won the Pritzker Prize, which is the the big award for architects. Okay, I remember when I was this was way early on when I was doing my portfolio or like trying to figure out like what does a portfolio want to be and everything. Mm -hmm. And I had mentioned to one of my professors, um, wouldn't it be cool if I did a comic book portfolio? And he goes, Ah, that would be awful. Nobody would ever do that. Big has like the best and biggest. Are you kidding? This is nothing. This is what this is? This is all, their portfolio is literally the telling the story of how these projects are put together. <gasps> and it's all done with, uh, it's all ar architectural storytelling. And they use like actual models, real photos. They do things over the top. And it is absolutely wonderful. So the thing with Big is they have these really great, cool, ideas that they do it's they're they can be simple but they do these um real simple diagrams to explain how the form came to be mm, mm. and because and they people love it because they can tell a really cool story with a couple diagrams yep that tell a great story for that yep. building and how, what it looks like and and you know and that's it like they're they're selling their projects and it's it's wonderful, and I, they took that idea and they turned it into a massive. This is a very large book. It's an omnibus size. That's it that's is. It's. Huge. I mean, I'm looking at it. it. Is it's over 400 pages. It is called Yes Is More, wow. an architectural or an archie comic on architectural evolution. Archie comic. It is a very very cool uh -oh. book. Did you bring dinner? Did did my wife just bring dinner? As John and I are talking about comic books, what? I think I just orgasmed a little. I'm you not going to lie. You just won the game of I what? just won the game. <laughs> yeah. I also need to shoot Rex. Ah, do you need help with that? No, he's right here. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Okay. Corn dog. Oh, my God. I'm not going to lie. That makes me super happy. <laughs> you can eat it. Okay. <laughs> um, this isn't... I, when they Thank did you, this, Andy. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, producer. <laughs> producer. <laughs> Wow, the it's old school. So they did this, and like it knocked everybody's socks off. Everybody who said, "Boy, that sure would be cool," but nobody like would like it. Everybody loved this. This is oh, this is on a lot of shelves. So cool. A lot of people love this. You know, a lot of students love it. And you know, like as far as like an easy breakdown of like how to tell your client this Man, is yeah. the story of the project. Absolutely. See, and that's what I was thinking about, like telling the client. It's a simple way because it is, as in the the Scott McCloud book. 
like it, it is an art form and it's very there's rules to it and you know mm-hmm. how, how to do it better and there it's simple and the beauty of comics is it follows uh, screen theory or basic page screen theory yeah is that you can pick up a comic book unless you're fighting the idea of the page you're literally going to read it in the right order like it's just going to make sense to, yeah. to you yeah because that that's how we're bred oh my god I love this I know it's wonderful if you want to borrow it. I kind of I kind of do. Well, there's more. <gasps> John, so, this is so good. So, when they started doing that, there was other architects who ended up doing graphic novels themselves. Oh, you're kidding. And on top of it, were, this, they, were they the first? I I think they're the first to to really kick that door in. What year did this come out in because if you said this before, mm, yeah, that's probably the this looks I would like, say late 2010s. Oh, so you were on that cusp when you said, hey, I, I, I want to do this. That was a couple of years after I said it. Oh, that's so fucked up. So, no, I mean, that's fine. I mean, just, I mean, they, it's super cool. But other people ended up started like saying like, hey, like how absolutely cool would it be? So there's uh, another one. Uh, this guy is by Jimenez Lay. Uh, it's called Citizens of No Place, an architectural graphic novel. Oh, and with this, it's, really it's just... It's architectural theory and people trying to, you know, tell, how do you tell complex architectural theory? And they're using comic <sighs> books as a way to kind of tell these, you know, these ideas of theory mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. how space works. And it's really, it's like the, the way that everything's put together is just, it's, it's like a real, they're playing with space and how it looks on the page and, uh, just how it's almost like just architectural. These are like very short architectural vignettes, mm, mm. and they're all like individual little stories, but they're all like it, they're all like little architectural experiments and theories that they have. So years ago, you and I were talking. Um, you said that architecture and film have some of the closest uh, aspects together, like you know, film and. Our, our architectures speak very highly of each other. I think that, I think that they can. Gene Nivelle is a, was an architect that, that he's another one who won a Pritzker. Okay, um, and he 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 drew a lot from film from making film. and architecture. And he did. I think a lot of his stuff had a little bit more to do with media. Mm. Oh, but you, I mean, in the way that you were talking about how how you have gutters, mm. there's things called like a, like an entry sequence that you could have in architecture where you know I would design points along a path, right? Where and you almost in the way that you would have to be able to read, a, uh, know the rules of a comic book on knowing where to stand, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, if, if things are placed there and if lines are put in certain places, you kind of know where you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to look at. Like, if there's a bench somewhere, if, if this is done by an architect, yeah, not you know, just somebody needed a, 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 a bench, know, a, a building somewhere, but like, yeah, 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 arch- yeah, right, if you're, right, if you're right. going to an actual architectural place, if you're if they put a bench there, they probably want you to sit down there and like like take everything in mm-hmm. so uh that here, here here's my question because what how you described it was film and architecture both tell the story of time like it's an art medium told in time mm-hmm. but i think the other thing that you've constantly brought up and i've tried to like think of some something else to do with film since you know i'm I have the film background. You have the architecture background. You you know a lot about film, though. So like, it's it's nice to be able to talk about this stuff with you because you understand it. Um, but film doesn't have the space, the space correlation. It does. How so? Uh, the space in my heart. When I say, <laughs> when 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 I say Jay, <laughs> Jay, how much space does this take up? I want I want this. How big is it? This. Oh, this. you're talking about. How, okay. How, how okay. much depth does it take up? How much? <laughs> how does? How does a person look when the when it's when it's very small? Okay. How does it look when you're looking up at somebody? Yeah. What's it like when you're looking down at Which somebody? Which is all film theory. These are right, all right, right, right. these are all things that you use in architecture. Like, what is it like to be up high? What is it like to be down low? I kind of want feelings of all. I kind of want to dig into this right now because Which brings me up to the next. Oh, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. So this is Gaston Backlard. He wrote a book called. Is that a name? Gaston Bacalard. Isn't that awesome? He looks like he's got a really cool mustache. 
I straight Gaston. up want to just I want to hang out with this guy and just eat bagels. Eh, he might have been a Nazi. Hold on. I don't want to hang out with this guy, but I'll still have the bagels. Anyway, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's Marlo. Oh, I, I think Marlo Ponzi, I think, is the original theorist that this was based off of. Okay. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Marlo, I, uh, it, it is the idea of um, uh, phenomenology. Mm. Phenomenology is kind of the idea that you... There is an event or something has occurred, and the way that everybody perceives it is going to be a little bit different because of the way that they they take in the world. Right. They're all different people. They've had all different circumstances. They're all different, and you have to kind of realize, like, how do how do people experience things? When P- Ponty kind of is the one who originally came up with the idea, but mm-hmm. Gaston Bacalard is the one who came up with that idea, but he does it in architecture. What does it feel like to be in these different places? What is this different space? So he wrote a series of, and why it's called Poetics of Space is because he goes through, hold on, let me get to his. The, Do you actually know what page you're looking for? Uh, no, the, in the beginning, it, it will literally, it just, it goes through simple things as like, uh, he, he, he has spaces as almost like a typology where he talks about like the idea of like yeah. what drawers are, drawers, tress, and wardrobes, like things that hold stuff. And he goes into all the different ways on things are held and all the different ways on how space is used on things that are held. He has things called nests. Nests are places that are very protected. Like mm. your, your basement right now. This yeah, is yeah, definitely yeah, your yeah, nest. Yeah. yeah, right. Anything where you can feel protected, where you can see but not be seen. Mm. I mean, you know, there's... Uh, it's where I eat my fudge sickles. He has things where he, he talks about shells, corners, miniature, uh, the dialectics of outside and inside. He's just talking about like different ways people experience space, and he's turning them into typologies. And I think the guy who really started to break down, like breaking down the ideas of different typologies, was uh, Michel Foucault. I've heard you say that name before. Mich- Michel Foucault is the he's a French philosopher, right? I think uh, crime, and, crime oh, and punishment. I think no, it's Vladimir or something. Or no, 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 no. I, no he, he wrote something on on punishment, something in punishment. It, it, it was a, a philosophy book, not the okay. Yeah, yeah, there's crime and punishment, but there's another one he wrote. Yeah, he wrote a, was r- he wrote a bunch of of books on, you know, essentially the what happens when you name things and stuff like that. Sorry, I had to mute my mic because I have a face full of fucking wiener. Um, what <laughs> speaking, is that? Speaking of the doubt, Michel Foucault was a gay man. So. <laughs> Rock on. What was that? The philosophy of when you name things. I mean, once it once it has a name, now it has officially a meaning. And there's yes. a, there's can be there's a danger to yes. naming things. Um there's there's another philosopher, his name's Ludwig Wittgenstein. Ludwig Wittgenstein. Dude, we need to have a party and just invite all these guys. I know. They're like, this is called the greatest name party. <laughs> we're, we're not allowed in, but... <laughs> Ludwig <laughs> Wittgenstein, I think the big thing that he's famous for is uh, something called tra- like Tractus. Anyway, he talks about how communication is like literally the best and the worst thing ever. Because it's it's miscommunication. You have all these different dialogues and all these things. And miscommunication is miscommunication and how people perceive things mm-hmm. uh, is quite literally the the root and of all evil. You know, there's like, for example, there yeah. is like somebody who has the Bible and there, there's a way that ah. people read the Bible. There's the way that they interpret it. There's the way and everybody has their own different interpretations. Correct. But, but there's one way to there's but there's all there's one book. I mean, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, yeah, right, the book, right. But like, it's the ways in which you perceive things and the different languages and the stuff that can be lost. Mm-hmm. And I think there was actually back, what was it like back in the 1960s? There was a, what was the, uh, Esperanto. Have you ever heard of Esperanto? Yeah, I actually know it re- really well. Uh, okay, I lied. I don't know it very well, but I know it very well from Red Dwarf, the, the TV show, because mm-hmm. all this, all the written language in Red Dwarf is Esperanto because the idea was that all the races and languages would eventually mix together and this was like the perfect language for the future. 
I think Esperanto was greatly influenced by Ludwig Wittgenstein. I mean, it makes complete sense. Of having just like, you eliminate all the different languages and have only and one have language, one. and everybody speaks the same thing. Yeah. Isn't that called communism? If everybody speaks the same thing? Well, if, if everyone follows one doctrine, and that doctrine is therefore correct. I mean, that's, communism is when... Communism... This, this just, just took a turn. <laughs> <laughs> Communism is is what happens when you essentially take uh, land and money by force. Oh, and end of communism story. Communism is, yeah. is communism is socialism by force. Uh, correct, correct. But there, therefore, then there. But that's but then like what is it. what is socialism though? Socialism means that you have to be. That means that the worker is in charge of the means of production. Yeah, yeah. Whenever has any society ever had the means of production completely in control of, of by the workers? Ev n never. It's never happened. No. So we've never really had socialism. Right. We've had we've hinted and played at things, but it's yeah, right, right, happened. right, right. You also there's uh, the redistribution of wealth, but like that would occur through through the workers having everything and everybody kind of having an equal say. I mean, it's a theory. It's not really a thing that. I think uh, Karl Marx, he he figured that it was just something that was going to happen over time. Mm. And the other thing with Marx is that you got to remember that he, when he when he wrote um, the the Communist Manifesto, it, all that was was just uh, people. It, he's looking at the holes in capitalism. He's not writing the the opposite of capitalism. It's just it's a. It's, it was uh, remarks on how this could go wrong. And let me say, a lot of the things that he said are right. Well, well, yeah, yeah. You know, he talked about late-stage capitalism, which yes. you would argue on what would be late-stage capitalism. Right. But... Yeah, oh, no, cor cor correct. Calling everything um, you don't like socialist, I'll just say is that's dumb. That's not <laughs> a, you shouldn't probably be doing that. Uh, my my friend, you met her today, Hilda. She actually came to this country because of communism. And every once in a while, she'll tell me a story about what it was like in Hungary. And I'm like, wow, I never knew that. I, I never had to know that in my life. I never had to know that, like, repression. You know, like, when I think of re repression, I'm like, don't draw titties on the wall in the high school. And I'm like, you can't stop me. I'm going to draw titties on the wall in the high school. This is a real story. This is, <laughs> if you know this. this is a real, real story. <laughs> but, like, like, she tells stories where it's like, Oh, my dad used to uh, make radios so we could listen to Radio Free Europe to know where to run to, but we couldn't tell the people who would come to our school uh, what stations they were at because then they would know our parents were, you know. <laughs> I was like, damn. Like, so I don't, I don't want to be an asshole telling somebody that living under communism was like the worst, like that it was not awful. I I'm sure it was. Yeah. But like living under any totalitarian, uh, anything uh, is going to be awful. Concurred. Like, I'm not saying one's worse than the other. I'm just saying. Well, I mean, if you're under a totalitarian regime of any sort, it's going to be bad. I don't think that there's anything wrong with having workers be in charge of stuff. But it hasn't been proven to work yet. It is a beautiful on paper theory that would be amazing if it was followed. But absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yes. But I think having parts of it makes society better. Concurred. You have a there's a, a road that I got here that was paid for by lots of people. And then they built it. Yep. I was uh, my education was paid for because I was in the military, which is do you know what the highest ranking uh, staff sergeant in the Air Force makes compared to the worst staff sergeant in the Air Force? The exact same thing. <laughs> really? It's the exact same thing. Yeah. All all E four and E fives and E sixes. Everybody gets paid the exact same according to their pay rate. Really? No matter what, you can you can go up and down in promotion, but they all get paid the same. Wow. Okay. Like if you're in different locations, you'll get paid like cola, which is just cost of living allowance and stuff mm, like that. Mm, mm, right. But like yeah, everybody got paid the same. Hmm. Are you gonna say that the uh, people didn't fight more because they all got paid the same? Are you saying? I mean, you know, now I could play. You know, I, I could do straw man and say, well, what what more do you not like about the, <laughs> uh, the your your fighting force? <laughs> but um. Having, you know, we have social security. Yeah, yeah. We have policemen. We have firemen. Correct. We have all these things that 
you know, you, you pay money for the greater good. Right. And then and then things get a little bit better. Now, when you have if you have like just one person over time and his kids just his or her kids just get to kind of keep their money over and over again. Yeah. I, I thought about this and my I my wife I grumble this to my wife sometimes. Billionaires are like dragons. E lab or rate. <laughs> Billionaires are like dragons. Like smog. Smog just lived on a massive mountain of gold. Okay. He didn't need it. And he could do whatever he wanted. Yeah. And he just he could terrorize people. He could sleep. He could do whatever he wanted. He just lived on money and he didn't need it. He didn't need any of it. He could fly. He could do whatever he wanted. Billionaires are just dragons. They don't need all that fucking money. Like, dude, you're gonna be fine with only a hundred million. <laughs> you know, and the thing that like the thing that you have like all these people that say like, well, you know, I want to be a billionaire. I, everybody who always see, like treats themselves like they're some sort of like temporarily embarrassed billionaire. Like, oh, I I'll, I could be a billionaire one day. Oh. There's find find one person. Find is is there any any billionaire in the past hundreds of years that came from nothing? There isn't. I'll I'll answer for you. There, there isn't. <laughs> I was gonna say I yeah Even, I wouldn't think so. Uh, Steve Jobs, he had like he got massive like ten tens of thousand dollars of loans to get his stuff off the ground. Is it great that he brought it to where it was? But I mean, he had yeah. help and he had a shit ton of money. Of course, he had Elon Musk. His family had a diamond mine, like uh, yeah, literally right, blood diamonds. Right, paid for all the stuff that he had, and he didn't invent anything. Correct, he didn't invent anything. He just would buy patents or like Correct. move into a thing. He's and not, then he claimed it, and then he just he just he's doing this thing where he's just like, this is this is me that I've always done. And now he's like really screwed himself into buying Twitter, yeah. and it's like, okay, now try and try and tweet your way out of this now, you know. I can't believe how how I know this is like old news, but I cannot believe how like childish he acted on Twitter, just like charging people for the blue mark and and just everything else. Like he just like he basically thought it was going to be a gold mine of revenue, and everyone said. So you want to charge us for this thing that we've been using for 20 years free and is probably the greatest source of news in the world. Yeah. And you want to put a paywall in front of it for using it. No. No, I'm good, man. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I, I think you, you could. Somebody else could just easily come up with it. Or, or or can you? The thing is, or can you? Well, I mean, you can't. Mm. I, the, the thing is, because the, these these monopolies are legal now. We don't have anything. That's bothering we have, me. We have yeah. nothing to stop these monopolies. We've never really had anything to stop monopolies. Even when we had the progressives in the early 1900s with like Teddy Roosevelt, mm. all they did was enforce it on people who weren't already massively established places. And he did like Illinois or a- AT and T was was broken up, but they ended up building into these massive things again. Like shit, dude, I have an iPhone. iPhones ended up, yep, they ended up getting really big because of AT and T. Yep, on their first their first go around, you know. But it's the dude. The game is rigged, man. Like there's you you have to you have to look at. I think I think it would be in t- it's smart to look at Marx and just see like what what did he see that was going to go wrong? Okay, you can't jump in with both feet with communism, but you can't jump in with both feet with anything. The, right now, at where we are, playing it's like playing Monopoly, but the whole board's already bought. There's hotels on everything, and even if somebody does by chance land in between the things and and land on. Uh, Community chest and, and free parking every go through. The other guys, their money's just going to go to their kids, and it never ends. Like the greatest time when everybody talks about make America great again. What are they talking about? The fifties? Because I tell you what, in the fifties, yeah. the, the tax rate back then was like 90 percent for for the rich. Like the, some of the money's got to go back into the community chest to use the, your monopoly terms again. You know, there's got to be something to to churn the system. But when you have something where people can just continue to make money, they don't have to really do anything for it. There's probably, dude, there's people that are still just living off of the proceeds of their great, 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 great grandparents. Right. Even Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson is a trust fund baby. He's from the, uh, was it the, 
who who did the TV dinner? The Swenson TV dinners? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah that's where he gets his money from. No he, never shit. Had, he never had to work. He never had to do anything. He just Ugh. made money off of he never had a he never had to work a job ever. He just showed up because rich people can go from place to place and, and they can just do it. And they can just do whatever they want. Because right. it matters on who you know. Right. Oh, 100 percent You know, but can you make like you don't want to knock everything down to zero either. Like you don't mm. want to, you don't like, like communism is bad. You, taking things by force is bad. And but here, man, you gotta, you gotta do something <laughs> or just people rise up and they just murder a hundred percent of the time. Every time just somebody <laughs> rises up and murders somebody. That yeah. happens a hundred percent of the time right. in human history. I just, I don't want to be alive when that happens. That's what I was going to get into next. Like, do you think that that's going to be a, an issue in our lifetime in America. Like when Trump was in office, we saw so much dissonance on and, and literally both sides, but let's be honest, really fucking heavy on the right wing. Like they stormed the white house mm -hmm. and granted. Okay. Now I will wholeheartedly give you the floor here. Cause you know way more about this than, than, than I do. But, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> Are we actually going to see a revolution? Are we actually going to see a civil war break out politically? Well, when you look at how the civil war happened, mm. it didn't happen because Lincoln did anything. It happened because they thought something might happen. Uh, explain that. What is that? The, that, the, that South, the South assumed mm. that Lincoln was going to uh, abolish slavery, so they preemptively left. Now we have nothing. Nothing says that Lincoln was going to do that. Nobody in their right mind wanted to open up that can of worms. If oh, anything, the so. only thing that they know is that Lincoln thought it was an awful thing, mm. but he it was a pile of shit that nobody wanted to step in and deal with. But because of people just making up shit and and stirring themselves up into a frenzy, yeah, they. They preemptively broke away from the union and everybody kind of was like, oh, oh, whatever, dude. It wasn't until they started firing on um, uh, base or like uh, a military locations north of the Mason-Dixon line that, that everything kind of really started to go off. No shit. That was yeah. like the, the yeah, initial. Yeah, they left. Everybody, nobody kind of did anything there because what do you do? And then the South attacked first. And then, like, then you had to take them seriously. And the the reason why we had to go through so many generals is because nobody wanted to. There was multiple, multiple generals uh, in the north mm. who put uh, General Lee and his forces into their place, and they could have ended the war so many times early, and they never did it. They that because it was like kind of one of those things where it's like, all right, guys, just you got to stop, you know. Nobody wants to slaughter other Americans. No, no shit. Nobody wanted that to happen. But after a while, it just turned into a war of attrition. And it wasn't until, you know, it was a, a guy who was a, 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 a multiple time failure who was a drunk, uh, General Grant. Yeah. Stuck to his guns. Like the only reason why they really liked him and why he ended up being the guy who won the war for everybody is because he was persistent. He just he never stopped. He never he never just gave them an opportunity to to cool. Like he treated it like an actual war, which, which it should have been and ended earlier. <laughs> yeah, but what do you, how do you do that? I know. Like uh, yeah, like I, we're I'm we, not the and home. I guess where I'm going with this is like we just January six happened. Mm. Like there was like a real coup. It happened mm. at. I remember turning around to my buddy sitting behind me and just kind of said, like, well, they finally did it. Like, yep. and, and I remember just joking around. Yep. And then I saw that Ashley Babbitt was shot. And I saw the video, like, minutes after it happened. What a crazy fucking world we live in. That, yep. you know, that video of this girl dying minutes after it happened. Nothing, nothing's happened. Nothing's happened. Like, yep. so there's a lot of things that are, are similar to that. Now, the, the thing that I always kind of wonder is, like, well... If there was a civil war, how would it break? Mm. Because in the past, we had the South, and we had the North, and there's a great book uh, 
called the 11 Nations of America. I highly recommend you. 11 Nations. The 11 Nations of America. Okay. And they talk about how uh, they go back and they look at uh, uh, re- religious and voting records mm. that go back hundreds of years mm. in America to kind of see how certain groups of people kind of progress across America and um, kind of notice that the North and the South have been fighting this war for a really long time. The North was a lot of, uh, it was a kind of a religious war is, is kind of what happened. The North was, it was a predominantly like a Catholic area where they had religions that were, oh. they had religions that were very, or were more, more uh, based in how to, how to have your faith in the community, God in the community. Right, right, right. Which is why education was always so important. Right. Um, you know, being like being being educated and not doing bad things was more highly valued. Was very it was valued in the community. Yeah. You know, like the 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 people who did like the Salem witch trials and stuff like that were the were the original North. But I mean, it was like you know everything was supposed to be a little bit very primitive proper. You had to be really good, but they they were more about community. Whereas in the South, they had more of. Uh, that's where your Baptists were, and mm-hmm. the, and the Protestants still is. And for them, their faith has more to do with salvation and their personal com- their personal commitment to God. Which oh, is why okay. you say, like, you know, I don't want like what you do with your family. I don't care about. I want to deal with me and my family. Okay, okay, it's my relationship. So you can see how there's in the way that they their relationships with God kind of like really set the the two apart mm. and you know they've kind of just been on a like a colliding course th- in that sense for a while um something that's kind of interesting uh when i was reading about the i, I read a book called the uh and i was telling you about this before i was reading a, a book called the 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 farmers the framers coup yeah, which, yeah, which is yeah. it's the book yeah. about how the de- or how the the constitution was written. And um some of the things that they were talking about was in the south how when they were coming up with this there was a lot of talk about like the south had a lot of demands, mm. a lot of slavery being one of them. You know, they wanted to make sure that you know, slavery was always going to be on the books. They never had to worry about it. They didn't want it to be taken away. Um, a lot of the people that were in the South were people, you know, were they were part of the aristocracy and they wanted their own little kingdoms and right. having black people as their slaves. I mean, it was just kind of a continuation of it. Um, one of the things they were talking about was how the South didn't do a lot of the fighting. It was mostly the North that was doing the fighting. There were now the when the when the British came. They're, they made their base of operation in the South. Okay. Because the South, the, all the cotton, all the things that they were getting. Right. And all the, I don't know if it was cotton at the time, but yeah. a, a lot of the yeah. exports and stuff. A lot of the exports and the cash crop were coming out of the South. Right, right. It was right. making the British a lot of money. Okay. And a lot of the ties were in the South. Okay. So the South felt way more comfortable, or the British felt way more, more comfortable, comfortable going in the South. Now they did kind of go into uh they went into Georgia, like Savannah, I think was one of the places they went to. They burned Big Savannah. Shipping harbor. Now there was there was a lot of they didn't burn. There was a lot of they 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 tried to they they wanted their base of operation to go there. A lot of people who lived in the cities there yeah, yeah, yeah. were against the British. They wanted right, to have that. Right, the people right. who lived in the mountains the people who lived in the mountains were they were still loyalists to the king. A lot of them. That seems so bizarre. Well, I mean, they a lot of the people that that now were in the Appalachian Mountains, where mm-hmm. the, a lot of the base of where the South was, a lot of them had just gotten there. They were they were brand new. They weren't treated very well by the people mm-hmm. that were at the ports, right? Um, and now they're like put in a position where, well, we're gonna we're gonna pick a new land, to, and the people who weren't nice to me are gonna be in charge, or the king and the queen, and like you got to pick, and a lot of them chose a lot of them chose to be loyalists. The Tories is what what they were called. Oh, yeah, I've I've heard that term. So the Tories 
the first the first civil war actually happened during the revolution when the people that lived out in the mountains hmm. were fighting the the patriots and it was like there's Weird. there's famous revolutionary slash civil war battles that happened in the south of the loyalists and, and the patriots um and something that i found kind of interesting was the there were there were a lot up north mm. a lot of them were like western pennsylvania and stuff like that right right and when everything was said and done they it, it got really bloody like they were murdering each other people were getting like tarred and feathered i mean they like they ran those people out of there a lot of the a lot of the loyalists either either left the country they went to canada a lot of them okay a lot of all eastern canada like where the trailer park boys are okay that's where a lot of the original the original americans that left because they didn't want to have anything to do with the united states went there no shit but that was the ones up north. Now the ones that stayed down south. That's yeah. Where are they going to go? Correct. Are, are you going to really go all the way up to Canada if you're in Georgia? No, you're not. Now some not did at that time. Some went to the Caribbean because the Caribbean. They went to the Caribbean because the slave trade was that was part of the slave trade. Um, so some of them went to the Caribbean. Yeah, but a lot of them just stayed. The, uh, that they stayed I know. in the south. <laughs> now, if you think about that. The, those wars happened in the 1770s. Okay. And they were young men when they were fighting. Yeah, right. When the Civil War was kicking off, it would have been 1865. So it's less than 100 years but, went by. I mean, there's no way those people are still alive, like, healthily to fight the war. Well, if you were if you were young and they probably fought, you could probably Teenagers. find somebody who were, who were really young. Yeah. If they... They had possibly just recently died. And you got to remember, these people lived out in the mountains. Mm. They lived oh. out in the mountains. Okay. And they, I'm sure there's plenty of Tories lived a really long time and really, really hated America. And there's a lot of people that probably said, we don't want to have anything to do with them. And when the war kicked off, yeah. I, I'm, this is me guessing. Okay, I, think, okay, okay. I think there's probably a lot of bad blood that was still around from the Revolutionary War that I of the Loyalists right. that didn't want to have anything to do with America and were definitely part of the Civil War. That's the South. And if you think about it, what was... Now, it, it was the, 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 the rebel flag yeah, was yeah. the X pattern. Yeah, right. That X pattern... L- is very very similar it's, to the actual royal flag. Yes, correct, correct. Of the home country. I never put those two things together until just now. WTF? I'm serious. I've never. I I lived in the South for long enough to see that flag on a daily basis. I've never put that together. Holy shit! A, a lot of that's derived from. It's derived from three flags. It was the one from Scotland. From the, Wales, the, and then... Scotland is the lion. Uh, the Wales, Wales, I think, is the lion. Scotland's the lion. And then the blue the blue frame with the X is yeah, Scotland. Yeah, that, that's... And then you have the white cross. Yeah, I think you might be right. I'm, I'm getting but confused. But there was a lot of Scott-Irish that were out in the... The Scots-Irish were the ones that were so out they're in taking the Appalachia. Their old, okay, okay, okay. So I was kind of... I, I kind of was wondering about that. And again, you know, I'm not That's a remarkable. historian, but it made me just think uh, reading a lot of that stuff. So, and I think it's funny that, you know, uh, the, the the current Republican Party yeah. is based off of, you know, their current base is predominantly in the South, yep. which is predominantly part of people that were in the Civil War. Still alive to this day. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, a lot of the stuff is going. I mean, you got to remember a lot of the iconography, the the, yes. the daughters of the Confederation yes. Yes. And put yes. up a lot of statues, made people right. think a lot of stuff about that. Like, like the GOP is the the King George, still just pissing off people in America right now. And it's funny because they're the ones that are always waving the flag and being the nationalists, but. 
I just think it's funny that like the, I think if you trace the roots back of it, they were the ones that never wanted to be American to begin with. That's really ironically funny and scary at the same time. Well, I mean, they don't, some of the other stuff, and I think I was telling you about this before the, when the, when the constitution was written, Mm. it was a, they ended up, they decided they were going to have a, a, all of the people who were part of the aristocracy, it was the elites. These are the people that had a shit ton of money. Of course. They were former, f- former aristocrats. They, mm-hmm. they had like the mm-hmm. royal blood and all that stuff. They were the second and third sons that didn't get any land or titles in, the, right. in Europe. That's why they came to America. Yeah. I remember George Washington was related to, to King George. Yeah. Um, and a lot of these guys were. When, when everything fell in America, they lost all that. Like they, they lost the ties to all that stuff. They lost their lands or they lost their titles at, at least. Well, well, right, right. And, you know, there was a lot of problems. The, there was there was fear of land, like where land rights were going to go uh, in the West. And by the West, I mean, like, who was going to have, like, the, the rights to the to the Mississippi River? They were worried that it was going to be sold to Spain. President oh, John oh, right, Jay, right, right, there, right, there right. was worry that President John Jay was going to sell the rights to Spain. Um, there was rights about printed money. Mm. There was worries about how foreign trade was going to happen. So there's a lot of problems. But these guys kind of, they knew it wasn't going to work. And instead of de- working through it, they just said, well, we're all, let's, let's come up with a deal. Let's figure out how to, let's, let's figure out how to put this thing together and make sure that we're going to be in charge. Right? And so we keep the power. So we keep the power. So the... You had all these guys write this thing up. There was a lot of uh, there was a lot of they went back and forth in between a lot of places. But the the original constitution didn't have the bill of rights. The bill of rights didn't come until after the fact. It wasn't until the the uh in in the the people who were for they were the federalists and they mm, had mm. something called the federalist papers. Right. were written after the fact and it was essentially uh there was Plebeius, I think, was the was the name that they gave that for right. the, um, for you know the the person writing all these letters on all the great things that'll happen because of this Constitution. These were the Federalists. The Anti Federalists were the ones who kind of lived out the country, and they wanted to have. They didn't want to deal with any of this. They knew they thought that something was up, and they weren't going to be getting their way. And they wanted a bill of rights. Like they wanted to have a bill of rights because in a lot of these countries, the king would offer up some sort of rights of man right, right, that they right. would have. And they were worried that they wouldn't get it. And George Madison didn't want to, he didn't want to put it in there because he said, well, if you say that there are rights, if you're implying that these are the rights and you're implying that they're these are the only rights. Mm. So he was worried about that. And I, I kind of understand that, but... Mm. I, I like I, I am pro I'm pro gun because I was in the military. I do think that it's not the gun that kills people. I do think it's the person that does it. Concurred, same here. I just think that the country is incredibly sick right now, and I think that we really need. Yeah. I think healthcare because there's been guns for a long time, right? Right. And I but think we've never had anything like this. And it's very easy to point out what's new in society is the cause of the. Uh, upping of gun violence like yeah. media and shit like that it's very yeah. easy to do but the, the problem with that is is anytime we look at history with anything like this we look at what is the new factor mm-hmm. you know like when columbine came out they did they weren't talking about the media they were talking about marilyn manson and doom because video crazy? games were like becoming ubiquitous with society Quick, let's blame somebody else before they blame us let's blame someone else before they blame us a hundred percent so now with media being globally, you know, just in our face all the time, it's very easy to say, well, it's obviously your 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 fault. It's like, well, I mean, it's it's it, it might be an attributing factor, but that doesn't mean it's the reason. You know, I remember like again with Columbine, when everyone was pointing fingers at games and Marilyn Manson. I was like, I liked both of those things. And you didn't murder a bunch of people. I didn't. It, just, it keeps happening. I, I do think that, in a way, media does do it. 
when you flash their name around like they're a, a movie star mm, mm. and you do have the kids of like I, i'll show them you have the cop the copycat the people like I did, oh I i'm gonna think, up that i'm gonna you know we did have like we did have copycat serial killers in yeah, the seventies. Yeah. Like every anytime somebody says, "Well, it's got to be back like how it used to be." It's like, uh, oh, back with the let's talk about kids that. Yep, getting yep, molested yep. all the time and all not the serial talked about. Killers. And it was okay. Yeah, it was just like, oh, that's just a creepy uncle. You oh, know, gross. He just does that weird thing that we don't. We're not a huge fan of. You know, fuck my kid. You know that, that that's what we don't want to talk about in society and have that child grow up yeah. to be a functioning fucking adult. Is not gonna happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Back back in back in the seventies, uh, <laughs> child molestation was like herpes. It's like ah, well, that happens to everybody. Fine. <laughs> but you don't talk about it. It's not until shit is like thrown in your face and digested and 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 just just when something is is talked about ad nauseum, that's when we move on to something else. Whether we're sick of it, tired of it, or we've digested all we can. I don't know where I'm going with this, but the whole the whole structure of going from one generation to the next, thinking that the last generation was the best thing ever. Like when I was a kid, things were good. Bitch, when you were a kid, horrible things were happening on a daily basis and nothing was being done to rectify it. It doesn't mean it's better. It means it wasn't talked about. You didn't have Facebook. That's what it comes down to. You didn't have people doing podcasts where they actually could talk about feelings. You didn't have anonymity the way we do now, where shit can be discussed without social vilification. I mean, women in droves get raped and they won't go talk about it to police because they're scared that it might damage a reputation or it's their fault or something like that. That's fucking horrifying. Oh, what's that? who's that one kid that was a swimmer? Well, we don't want to charge him with, with that. that oh, life. the rich kid. I remember this. Yeah. I couldn't tell you his name. Yeah, I don't remember his name either. We should Haunting. find out. Yeah. He just he raped some girl by, like in a dump like in a, behind a dumpster. Behind a dumpster. He was a college kid and yeah. just got away with it. Well, he's really, try, to, try to get away with he's it. He's really good he at did, swimming. But... Yeah, but he's really good at swimming. And that'll make him feel sad. I know you're being hyperbolic when you say that, but I remember the news coming out saying something like that. You mean Fox he, News? Well, I saw, someone said. And that so, made him feel sad. It was something very along those lines. It was How something dare like, you? Like, you're, you're risking his future. I have a question. <laughs> he just destroyed this young lady's. How fucking dare you? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, so sorry. Let's get back to books. Yeah, we did. That was a hell of a... That was a hell of a tangent. Yeah. Oh, but there's Italian Cavino's uh, Invisible City. Whoa, 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 Invisible City. Okay, so... This is uh, a good one, actually. In film, editing is called the invisible art. Because if you do it right... You should never notice it. How does that correlate to your architecture? It does. So this is to piggyback off of poetics of space. The okay. Idea of like how do, how do people see and experience space? The idea of Invisible City, it was written by Italian Cavino. This is like seriously one of the funnest short reads that's Italio Calvino, Invisible Cities. I think you have to have a cool name in order to write a book. I know. So so far, I'm never going to write 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 an so awesome far. book. Well, you could. You got a cool name. Did you just pull out like awesome notes? These are actually when I wrote my thesis. This was my notes. Oh, that's so badass. So it is funny that my notes are still in there. So the all this is is it's this is uh, oh, what is his name? The Marco Polo. It's a, it's a Polo. discussion of Marco Marco Polo Marco Polo. It's a discussion of Marco Polo, Polo. when he's talking to uh, Kublai Khan. <gasps> okay, I was joking around. Back that up. Re say that sentence. And all it is is Marco Polo is a he's an explorer, and Kublai yeah. Khan has him in his court, and he and he just wants him to describe all the places he's been. Okay, and I don't I don't, don't want to ruin it. But I'm going to spoiler alert. Spoiler for this alert. new book on the market. So all he's 
what what he does is he describes cities cities in memory. Will you show that to the camera? Because that's actually actually really really, really cool. Like, like I mean the the inside it looks like it's almost I don't I don't know how good you're gonna see it with the the light lighting and lighting's really yeah. not designed I mean, to these show. Are, it is super short, but it's it it almost looks like a list. Like, it is like a grocery list. It, they are these these are they're just very very. Sh that's it. It's just like one page. They're short descriptions. Of this city, where it's only a city and eyes, or a city and names, city and the dead. But the thing is, uh, all Marco Polo is doing is describing the same city, but he's talking about different parts of the city. Oh, and it's like you can actually do an analysis of like what he's actually talking about, and all these things. It is such a cool book. I when you were you when I showed up today, you were talking about. Well, I hate writing things. Uh, well, well the, the funny not me. Oh, my business partner. Your business partner <laughs> yeah. saying how, how much she didn't like writing things, and that's funny. When she said that, I thought you should definitely read this book. Can I see that? Yeah, absolutely. Because it is it is the most precise and eloquent way to describe places and space and things. Italian Cavino is like one of the greatest. He's such an awesome writer. You know how like um, there's like a, a, a psychology test that you open up a book and the first word you see like says something about you? Mm -hmm. uh, cockfighting. Yep. Sorry, mom. <laughs> oh, I like that like some things are italicized. It, may, it makes it like literally feel like it's a different space rather than the normal not italicized. Oh, there's another book. Have you ever heard House of, of Leaves? House of Leaves. I love House of Leaves. Have you finished it? No, fuck no. Oh. <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> it's the only time I ever got nightmares reading a book. Really? I got nightmares reading it. Heart Shaped Box did for me. Joe Hill. Mm. Oh, is that, Super simple, was that, dumb was story. That in, was that in reference to, to Nirvana? No. Um, well, I mean, it, it might it might have been. I, I don't remember that being. It's a very short, short story. Uh, but they get a box and like there's a ghost in the box. I'm not giving it away. That's the fucking plot. Um, but there's a scene in it. Like I really love Asian cinema. Okay, I love Asian films because it's so <laughs> wildly obtuse to how I grew up with American storytelling. So they they're not afraid to jump around or elongate moments. For instance, uh, when you think of like a horror film, let's just say from the early two two thousands, they relied heavily on jump scares and stealing from from Asian. Well, they, yeah, very heavy. Which actually, the one I'm going to talk about is um, there's a movie called Pulse. It came out in Japan, I believe, either late nineties or early two thousands. It's really good. Uh, then they did an American Pulse, and I literally watched them back to back in the same night. And I watched the Japanese one first, and my wife and I, we were dating at the time, and we were like, there's this one scene where a ghost is walking down the hallway while a guy is like pushing back in his like couch, and he's feeling like really uneasy watching this ghost. And how they did the ghost was they shot the ghost character in slow motion, but everything in the scene is in normal motion. So as it's walking, she stumbles just a little bit. And we lost our shit because the, the 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 frame of reference was out of place, and they held on the shot way too long. So we're like feeling crazy uncomfortable watching this, and we're like like we we could feel ourselves literally like pushing back in our seats because we don't want it to come near us. Kind of like 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 when uh, Sadako comes toward the screen in the ring. Oh yeah, which is another good example. So in Great. the pulse, they do the pulse. Uh, the scene where the the monster is walking down the the hallway. And she sprints and then screams at the guy. And Andy and I looked at each other. We're like, off. <laughs> we're done. <laughs> um, so I like the <laughs> idea of being able to explain different things in different cultures and different like ways. Of, like, How simple is it to put your whole story in italics when everything else is not? And it literally made me look at that page and go, what part is this talking about? That's, that's, a, that's, a that's, good one. that's very cool. Speaking of different cultures. Brings us to our next book. <laughs> Brings us to our next book. Oh my God, it's like we planned this. So Edward T. Hall, this is a book that they have, they'll often have architecture Edward students. T. Hall. Edward T. Hall. Oh, if you're going to be an architect, name your 
like have a name that's part of a building. Edward T. Hall. You're right, that is. <laughs> so he wrote a book called Hidden Dimensions. <gasps> Hidden Dimensions. And he has there's multiple books that he has, right? Um, Why? Because he, he found was, them. He was he was paid by the CIA to come up with ways on how different cultures interact with each other. Okay. They wanted an actual quantifiable way on how this is it's probably I wonder now that I'm saying this out loud like is this a continuation of like 1930s like race science possibly yeah but what he ended up doing with hidden dimensions is he took different races of people mm. and he studied uh the different distances in which they interact. Oh, I love this. I love this. So he noticed, like, this book is particularly uh, American white ma- American white males. Okay. Is what it is. And he did it on other races. But he talks about their bubbles and how big they are and mm. what happens at those bubbles. What what year did this roughly come, mm, come out in? This is either 65 or 75. Okay, so when the CIA was really digging deep into yeah, like the yeah. psychological shit. Yeah. Which, by the way, uh, oh my God, I need to talk to someone who knows that shit, who knows like what the CIA was actually doing, because that shit is fascinating. It is beyond fascinating. Anyway, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Please, please. Um, what... After he did all of his studies, mm, mm, mm. he ended up what he ended up calling it was called proxemics. Proxemics, that's a good name. Like proxemics, pro- pro- proximity, yeah. and proximity, like the study of proximity. And he yeah. had like the, um, from like zero to eighteen inches is your intimate space. Oh, and I've heard of what this. A, yeah, what occurs within the intimate space is either fighting or having sex. Yeah, is essentially fighting, thing. fucking, and then yeah, the fighting and fucking, and then you know from. Like 16 inches to like four feet is your personal space, or it's essentially an arm's length. Okay. And like it's what what occurs within an arm's length, who can be inside there, further out, goes to social space. Okay. And then from social space, I think is group space. Okay. But like even like, like tribe mentality, kind of like uh, this is like the group. The group. Well, it's actually the size of that, I think, goes out to 30 feet. And the number, the number that he came up with in mm. this book is actually why. And according to what they said, the reason why the the distance at which the Secret Service wants to p- keep people away from the president is actually based off of the proximity. No shit. And like, wh- who's going to be inside those bubbles? Okay. And it's the distance at which you can have any sort of evasive maneuvers. Uh, see, that's what I always thought was the how long does it take to me to draw my gun to be able to save some, someone? Yeah. And like yeah. the the things that you do within those bubbles are, okay. are very different depending on how far it is correct correct, you correct. know and you know at the 30 feet out you can say it's like the distance at which if w- beyond 30 feet mm. that's the distance at which you could like call people names and swear at them and maybe shoot at them or whatever and, and you don't have to like have any repercussions oh which i and i always thought that was really interesting because i read this for my thesis because a lot of the stuff i was reading and writing about had to do with augmented reality right reality and virtual reality and i always wondered well, how is that gonna occur in a, in a virtual space. In a virtual you, space. Like, how yeah. does that even happen? And I spent years trying to figure out, like, how that would all go together. Which brings me to my next book. This was written right before my thesis came out. And essentially, I didn't have to write it anymore because the guy wrote the book before oh, I got through no! it. Oh, It's called... I remember you telling me about this. It's called Digital Proxemics. This is super cool. This is, the, this is how Proxemics works. In a it, digital space. In a digital space, which is super cool. And like not only in a digital space, but how people use digital, uh, digital things. Do they go into stuff that's not AR VR? Do they go into like how social you, how network you space? Your phone? I am. I I need to read this. This one's super cool because they'll talk about like, uh, uh, well, for example, this table. Mm. You have round tables if you want people to talk to each other. <gasps> round tables really? are for people because. You normally are going to only talk to the people across from you or to the side of you. So if you have round, if you have round tables, people will talk to themselves more. But if you have long rectilinear tables, how oh. often do you talk to somebody who's all the way at the end of the I table? I don't go to anyone's house that where I talk to them. So you know what I'm talking. Yeah, yeah, about. yeah, yeah. Okay, so the this is where I live, John. <laughs> <laughs> like, but I do everything. Here. <laughs> I table. do everything here. 
That's because I want to talk to everybody. <laughs> we are talking to everybody at a round table. Yeah. But th- I, I always felt like the, just a round table felt more inviting, more like even even levels. Like no one was higher than anybody else. And it is designed that way. Interesting. And that is called, um, what is it? Uh, uh, sociopedal. Oh, like like a level of no, so- like, social status? Like petals. Like petals on a flower. Sociopedal oh. versus sociofugal is the other one. What's the fugal? Fugal is the one where you deal with it from far away. <laughs> Having something if it's... And if you have sociofugal space, uh, that's like the, the things where it's the seating where you're only going to be by yourself. Mm. And they talk about how people... What's another thing they talk about? Like people, uh, they, call, they call it like camping or bedding. It's essentially designing spaces that people are going to want to use their devices. So if I design a space where you have chargeable oh, things okay. or you can have access to cords or you do have a, like, it's designing all these spaces so you're more willing to use your device. Right, 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 right. And then on top of that, it is the, you know, having different apps on your phone to make you want to use them more. Like it's. Oh, so so that's where I wanted to go, go, go with it. Um, and they do. And they do have that in here. Oh, I'm. This is a neat book. Phenomenally in, in interested in reading that. This um, is uh, Digital Proxemics, How Technology Shapes the Way We Move by John A. MacArthur. That one's a neat one. So most of my my career now is focused on marketing aspects in cyberspace, in digital social pla- platforms. And it's like, how do you bring people into you when you are putting out one thing and a thousand other people are doing the exact same thing, how do you stand out? Not just visually, but in the culture, in the space, in the time, in the frame. Like there's so many things you have to worry about. You and I were talking about this, what is it, two weeks ago? When we were talking about like, hey, you want to do this video project, that, that's awesome. Here's what you have to concern yourself with if you are going to be marketing it as like social content or something like that. Like there's so many different things you have to think about. So what this says to me is this is breaking that down. And I, oh my God, I mean, you know me well enough that I love everything broken down. I want to see it in pixel form. I want to see it in numerical bullet points. You know, like I can break down a film for you and tell you exactly, like you just, we'll we'll fucking put it on mute and I'll tell you exactly what they're talking about, just based on the editing and the color fucking toning. Mm -hmm. But this is talking about a cyberspace and a space in that. Like it's literally talking about the, the second fucking word in where we live and do business now. Mm-hmm. But what's gonna happen next is the big theory of technology is we're looking at full dive um, VR. Like think think about uh, Ready Player One, but full dive, meaning you're hooking up through your brain, mm-hmm. not your visual go- goggles. So once you're in that space, economy, has to happen in that space. Academics has to happen in that space. Fucking politics has to happen in that space. I I understand, and that's where a lot of arguments are coming up, and I would love to have a conversation one day about this. But this is screaming, here's the foundation for how that can work. I am fascinated to read that. I I think that People can ask themselves, like, can we do something? And they should also be asking themselves, should we be doing something? I was, I was, I was hoping that that matched up with the... Yeah. Um, I don't know what you feel about that. I definitely... Plugging directly in, I think is so bad. I have different ends of the spectrum that I argue with. I think in, in some cases, how it could work. There, there is um one of the... Founders of the World Wide Web and virtual communities was actually one of the people in The Grateful Dead. He wrote a book. Super, he is like the godfather of of virtual and community space. I have his book at the house if you want to borrow it. Holy shit. But he wrote, he's like the OG. He wrote it back in the 90s. Wow. I wish I would have taken the information that we had in the nineties a little more seriously. Like literally we were at the birth of the web 
when it was in its infancy, not at, at the birth, but at when it was infancy, like when people were going online to find chat rooms. And I should have noticed it then because when, when you and I used to go online, when we were 15. Being trolls back then? Well, yeah. Okay. We were trolls. Yeah. We were assholes. But <laughs> what did we search out? We, we didn't ser- search out knowledge. We didn't search out how to build things. We searched out a community. How amazing is that, that literally we had each other. We were in the same fucking room most of the time and we were chatting to people online, but we searched out a community. Why didn't we see it then where we should have said, this is the way of the future? I think I, I have an answer for that. I think because we were white suburban kids and we didn't have to find anything because it, it was at our fingertips because it was at our fingertips mm. but and i think the the reason why he wrote that one of the things that he that that the i wish i could remember his name i'll, I'll let you have it no the the guy who wrote the the guy who was in the grateful dead oh oh oh, oh. uh they, they were talking about how um it was it was an oasis for like gay kids in like montana yeah, right. To have somebody to talk to. Absolutely. Um, who was like them. And they didn't know if they were... Okay. They were just... They knew that the church told them they were bad. And they had the anonymity, so they didn't have to feel bad about talking and they, about who yeah. they were. So, I mean, I think that was like one of the, like the first big great things. Get closer to the mic. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I think that was one of the first big great things. And, you know, I, I don't think that we... We were white kids in Chicago and Suburbia. Yeah, right, right. We, yeah, we were we we're literally, we we have no idea. I, I still don't think we knew how good we had it, you know? Oh, that's true. Things were better back then. <laughs> yeah, we should make it great like that again. <laughs> <laughs> make America 1996 again. Ah, uh, speaking of the 1990s and uh, making America great again. <laughs> Jesus. There's another book that I told you about called... Uh, the Umberto Echo. Did oh, I tell you about oh, the Umberto God. Yeah, Echo yeah, yeah, yeah. with the Earth Fascism? Yeah. That was also written in the 90s. Appropriate. Yeah. So Earth, Earth Fascism. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay we, right. You know, we don't have to talk about this. We can talk about this another time. I was going to say, this is, this is a giant topic yeah, is a, that yeah. I want to start off pissing everyone off as soon as we start that podcast. Yeah. I just want to like eliminate half of our audience. <laughs> Um, dude, okay, so is that all your books? Because I see two little books and I see a nope. purple book. So we got, I do have, so back to oh, the comics. We haven't gotten to the comics yet. This, yeah. this was a guy's master, his, like his P, it's either his PhD or his master's. Thesis. I looked through this. This is, this is bizarre. As far as drawing goes, have you ever seen this before? Yes. So it is you showed called, it to me. It's uh, Nick uh, uh, Swanis. Swanis? So, Anis. It's called Unflattening. Yes. Um, it is. It is incredibly. It's very hard and detailed. Yeah. It is. It's gorgeous. Like it is the most. It is the David Mack of architecture books. I don't. I've never been able to like fully wade into this. Yeah. Like you, you either really need to. Like I, I would take a vacation just to read this. Like if I had a week, to just read this, to yeah. like just drink coffee. And just sit in nature with no phone and just absorb this because there's so much here. God, that sounds like fucking heaven. It this is, is like one of the very first books you ever showed me about our, our architecture, by the way. Mm, I just bought that one not that long ago. No, you had this back at... No, I remember you showing this to me when you were in uh, um, the apartment in Elgin. Oh, uh, yeah, I did have that in Elgin. Yeah, because you had it in the in the hallway. I just bought it in the, when I moved in. Oh, That's oh all right, all right, all right. Yeah, one of my professors actually is the one that told me to get that. He essentially told me that if if I could do anything like that, that it'd be like, he's like, you would get an A for sure. <laughs> but that is... Bitch, if you did something like this, you don't need school anymore. Oh, my God. I mean, it is... It's that... It's it's dense. It is. It's it's very similar to the, the Citizens of No Place book. But it is, it's incredibly well drawn. It, it, it is. It is not only 
very visually dense, mm. but the topics that they're talking about, there's just a lot to chew on. You could just mm. sit there and just try and figure out what the hell you're reading forever. <laughs> Which, which I respect the shit out of. Yes. I really do. Like if you, if I gotta like sit there and go oh, through this. The, oh my god, the rain! I love the way this looks. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, that guy is crazy talented. Oh, this is all like stippling, and this is uh, um, um, uh, uh, what are they called? They're not quills, but they're like quill-like ink pens. It's got, it's like a blade. There, there, there's felt pens, there's marker pens, there's pens, and then there's like dip pens that are like a blade. Like the fountain pen? Fountain pen, thank yeah. you. That That's with this. This is phenomenal. Ooh. Because like fountain pens I think are really cool because like you're literally like drying out your ink very fast. So you have to like keep adding more life to your art. Oh, I love that. It's I never thought so of that pretty. One. I love uh, fount, fountain pen ink. But it has, it has to be dip. If you have the interior, it just doesn't feel feel the same. There's something about like the loss of 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 ability to keep going. I love that. That is cool. Good God. This but is I mean, this is so intense. Yeah. I like the all the comic book ones. I really thought that you would probably dig these. Uh, I mean or anybody I mean, else who yeah. All be, all one person of the people listening <laughs> to this. You know what? This um I okay, because I have to correlate it to sound something I know that's not comics. Um I watched a movie called Final Flesh. Did I ever tell you about this movie? Mm-mm. Final Flesh. Um it kind of reminds me of this because when I tell you about it, it sounds brilliant. But if you watch it, you go, what the fuck was that? <laughs> and Final Flesh was an experiment done by an art, an art filmmaker who, uh, instead of shooting the film himself, he found porn companies around the world I think most of them are in America. One was in a- Africa. But he found these porn companies where you would send them a script. You'd send them like $1,000. Is that your car? Okay. Uh, you know, you send them a script. You send them like a, a money. And like the more script you had, the more money you had to send. You send them the scenario and the dialogue. And then they film that. And then you get a personalized porn. Okay? So what he did was he wrote the, and he and this is how he put it, he wrote the most pretentious bullshit he could think of and wrote it into a script and he sent it out to like, I think like five or six different studios. And the story was, oh, we just woke up. We are the reincarnations after the apocalypse. So every story starts with them waking up and ends with the apocalypse. So it's just like a continuous thing, right? It is the worst acting, the worst video, the worst lighting. It is utter and complete nonsense. And Andy and I watched the whole thing. And halfway through, I said, nothing is making sense. I don't get this. I need to understand what this film is. So I paused it and I read the synopsis of how it was made. And I was like, holy shit, this is like the greatest piece of art I've ever seen. Because basically he's saying, fuck you, art community. (laughs) And he's like, I don't know. There was like so many different levels to it. But uh, I love it. I I love it. I love it. I, I, there's a lot of people that don't like, no, that's fine. (laughs) There's, there's a lot of people that don't like, you know, like postmodernism type of things. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think like when done really, really well. Yeah. Like you don't have to have your shit look like Rembrandt. You don't Correct. have to do these things. Like I'm telling you, like a really great idea and following through is awesome. Mm. It's and yeah, it's it's a, there is an art form into doing it. I mean, and it's so cool. And if you got like a great idea, I'm like, and that's the, that's why it's like, it's so frustrating when you like take people to museums and they don't read. Like if you just, I uh, when I tell people who don't like going to museums, yeah. I said like. All you got to do is just be honest to yourself. Look at the thing. Read what it's called. Read what it's made out of. Just like the little placard. Yeah. And just think to yourself, what do you feel? Like it can be good. It can be bad. You know, if like a, even a video or something like that, mm-hmm. just like, just take it in. And like, you know, you can like say you just look at the thing and you said like, this is crap. You read the placard. Yeah. And then you look at it again and go, holy fuck, this is awesome. Yes. 
And that's happened to me so many times. Where I will look yep. at it and be like, I'm not impressed. And I'll read the thing and go, holy fuck, this is yep. the most amazing thing ever. I remember telling you there was a... The, I love that we just sat in the exact same position. Yeah, the, I remember when I was in... Uh, I was in Portland and I told you, oh my God, I just saw a video of a, of a, it was a bell that they attached to a demo. It was like a demo thing. It was like a, how they have the, the equipment that has like a big spike on it and they use it to demo buildings. Okay. okay. But they attached a bell to it and it was this, it was so fucking, it was just a guy demoing a building with a bell. With a bell. And it's just making all this awful racket. And I remember reading the thing and be, and then just saying like, oh my God, this is amazing. And just sitting down for like a half hour while my wife was looking for me. Because <laughs> why would my husband being in the, be in the room with the bell ringing like crazy yep, yep. and just hearing equipment? And it was because it was the coolest fucking thing ever. Yeah. Read the placard, people. Read the placard. I was in the Chicago Art, Art Museum and they were in the mo- modern art. We were in the modern art section. I saw just a big pile of candy in the middle of the floor. Yeah. Uh, this is absolutely hands down become my favorite piece of art I've ever seen in my life. And if I had not looked at the placard, I would have thought nothing of it. I honestly would have thought it was someone fucking around and throwing candy in a corner. Um, but what it was, was the artist was, uh, it was a post humus, post humor, post humus. After he died, he, he wrote how he wanted the art to be made and he wanted, um, a pile of candy to be the exact same weight as the weight he died at because he had AIDS and he his life was cut short. So he wanted people to take a piece of candy as taking a part of his life with them so that he lived on forever in so many different stories and so many different avenues of life and stuff. And it, I had to sit down because it hit me so damn hard that's like, this this is breathtaking. This is amazing. And it, like it hurt. It hurt to look at it. You know, like that's a human life right there. In candy. In candy. And I know part and of it. And he wants you to have and some. And he wants it. you to have some. So like I couldn't bring myself to take some. There is take no some. greater metaphor. I'll just hit some candy and I just want you to have some. Yeah. Says John Wayne Gacy. Oh boy, they got dark really quick. <laughs> so the next book, <laughs> the next book so, is that's why you guys check in for the class. The so th- I think that this one is there's a guy named Frank Francis D K Ching. This guy writes everything. Every fucking he is name. he is literally he he does everything. He does another thing called a visual dictionary of architecture. Yeah, I love this guy. Is like one of the greatest illustrators to ever live. This guy does everything by hand. He illustrates like whoa, all of whoa. these books. He is oh, okay. So I, I got to ask: when you do it by hand, part part of me is like the elitist asshole when I'm, I'm saying this. So please take that with a grain of salt and smack me back into position. By hand, are you still using rulers and tools to be straight, or are you good enough to freehand schematics like that? Nobody is. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There's no. There's no human that could hand without a straight edge draw a building. Nobody. Not with that attitude. Not with that attitude. Sorry, I didn't mean to, to derail that <laughs> shit. Okay. Here's this guy who does all his own handwriting. So, uh, all his own hand. But drawing. he draws all this stuff. Okay. I think I, I told you before. I'm absolutely one of the things that they don't really teach you a lot about when you're in school, and they probably should, is about building code. A lot of times you'll talk to people and they'll say... How is that not talked more about? That seems like day one. Because the building code is different everywhere. Yeah, but aren't there universal rules? Kind of. There's a lot of code. Okay. So when, when I go, if somebody says, John, I want you to design me a building. I want you to build me a house. Build me a house, John. I hear that. How many times <laughs> I got to hear that? Somebody says that they want me to design a building. The very first thing I got to do is I have to go to your city. Yeah, right. And I have to go to whatever your your the building department is that okay. you guys have there, planning, whatever it's going to be. It's going to be different in a lot of places. And I have to look up all the codes that they have. And there's dozens of different codes. So you have the the building code. Okay. You have their zoning ordinances. 
they have the plumbing code, they have the electrical code, they have the mechanical code, they have the energy conservation code, they have the American Disability Act, which is isn't technically a code, but it's the it's the um, the American the, it's the ADA is a uh, um, a civil rights act. Yeah, right, 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 right. Um, so you have that. You have the federal one versus the state one. Now you have all these codes, and then you have it's different for every state. So every state's going to have their own version, and then for every state that has their own version, it's changed every three years. So it depends on which city. What depending on the city, it's going to have what year are they going to be using? Because I'm currently working in a place that's still working in 2009. And then for all that they have, then they have their amendments that they've done to that code. So this is why you don't teach it. Gotcha. So you got like got so it. you have to teach like okay. you can teach like the overall big code, but right, in three right. years it's gonna change anyway. But it's good to huh. know it's good to know all like all the things. So when I when I go to build something, the very first thing I have to do is I usually gotta go to your zoning code. And when I go to zoning, I have to find out there's gonna be requirements for all the everything that's gonna be on the site, I have to find out what type of building it's going to be. Like if you want, okay. if you want yeah. it to be a house, it's going to be, okay, it's going to be a residential. And I have to see, I have to look at a map of where you're going to be going and yeah, I got to yeah, see yeah. What, what is allowed to be built in the, in the zone that you're in. Okay. So when you look at a city, there's urban planners that decide like what your entire city is going to look like. Oh, have, right, you have right, commercial right, districts, right. you have residential districts. Right. You know, there's rules on how things could be changed from one thing to another, and they have things called PUDs. PUD is the greatest thing. It's a planned urban development. Planned urban development. Usually, like, your, your cool things where, where there'll be some sort of incentive to where they either don't have to follow the zoning ordinances, or you can write your own kind is it, of in Is a way. that, like, parks? Uh, no, like... Usually, like if you're in like a downtown area, mm. I know like in Elgin where yeah, we are, yeah. in in Buttertown, ooh. ooh, up on the river, there's there's areas along the river where, where Elgin's like, we really want something cool here, yeah, yeah, we yeah. don't know what we want, yeah, tell, give me what you got, and give me what you got is is a planned urban development. Is it really? Yeah, you could. So if it's like, well, you know, you're not gonna get like industrial stuff there, yeah, but like you know. That could be a movie theater. It could be commercial. It could be residential. It's like, give me what you got. Give me what you got. Yeah, let me see what you got. Okay, okay. And and you can kind of come to them, and they they hope they do that you make something cool and and make the place better. Right. And when I go there, I have to. There's all sorts of rules on the based off. There's ratios based off of the size of the space and how many square footage of your space. It's called the the far. Uh, it's, it's a far ratio, and it's based off of the square footage of your site and how much space based off of the site. So if you have a far of one, that means if I have a 5,000 square foot site, I can use all 5,000. But if I have a far of, or I will say 10,000 to make this easy. If it's a far of 10,000, I can build a 10,000 square foot site. Okay. If I have a far of two, I can have 20,000. If I have a far of 0.5, I have 5,000. So it's based off of the square footage of what you have. Oh, oh, it's oh, a rating oh, oh, oh. of like how much you have there. When you have, on top of that, I have to see what my zoning and setbacks are. So you're the for the for the setbacks, depending on what you're building there, will depend on what the setback will be. And you usually you're gonna have setbacks to make sure that you have the proper amount of lighting. So you don't want to have like a twenty story building next to a one story building. Understood. So depending yeah. on what's there. Right. Uh, you can have a setback that's they're often like from the front of the uh, the front of your your neighborhood. Mm. Often they'll have like twenty feet, mm. and that's just so the city, if they want to, they can like put in pipes and sewage and everything like okay, that. You, okay, technically you have to take care of it, but you don't own it. It's owned by the city. They can do whatever. I they don't. Want yeah, there. yeah, yeah. I, the whole front part of your house. I know. I know. I guess yeah. it's over there. My last house, we had an I- 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 issue with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, like. So I have to check all that stuff. And then the other codes that we have to deal with, like with the building, there is all of these series of things that make, like, this is why you're, the house is at a minimum of this height and can't be beyond this. There's a reason why everything is done. And Ching does an entire book on, like, all of the ratios and all the little bubbles and everything. Holy shit. That make 
like for uh, like for setbacks and stepbacks on roofs, on how the shape of a building there, there's so much of a building that's just shaped by this code that nobody really knows about, and it's just it's absolutely fascinating. And because it's not this isn't the actual zoning code, right, right, yeah, right, yeah, right. I, I could not show this, but if anybody would like to see like an actual. You know, the reason why I went through all the comic book stuff first is to go to these really boring okay, things. Yeah, fair enough. Where you could, I could literally show you, like, this is how fire code works, and these are the dampers, and why a building is shaped the way that it is. Like, if you ever go to, uh, like, an atrium inside of a, a mall, and there'll be the glass. Yeah, There'll right. often be, like, a glass part of the railing that goes down. Those are your dampers. So it can that part is made to fill up with smoke. So that fills up with smoke so it doesn't go up. I know exactly shows. what you're talking about. So there's all these like little weird things that you have to build. Whoa. Right? The way that you're... So, and again, this oh. is all just the drawing of it. And also, it's very fascinating. Okay, 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 okay. So I know I made the joke earlier about the hand-drawn shit, but he literally hand-draws all this. Yeah, he is. That's insane. He is very good. He is very, very good. Uh, this might sound um, like his uh, shitty, like but is, is he autistic? No, he's just a guy that. No, I don't. I don't. I don't mean it negatively. I mean like usually autistic people, like they have one thing or two things they're like no. super fucking good at. Like they're like crazy. No, dude, good. he's just a guy that likes to draw. This is ridiculous. Oh my god, he is incredible. I want to play D and D with this dude. My uh, some of my professors at SIU. Know him. They know him as Frank. Everybody knows him as Ching. That's just Frank to them. Yeah, I think he, I think years ago, he just kind of, he showed up and he talks to people. At, this is insane. But that's just the, so for that one, that particular book is the Visual Dictionary of Architecture. And like that's, the, the visual if you want to, if you want to know what all the neat, cool things are in architecture, Francis Ching's Visual Dictionary of Architecture is super, super cool. Oh my god. I think god. a lot of people like a lot of people not necessarily styles. It seems to be that's something that everybody's I, always interested in is in styles and things well, like that. I think that's because I mean, to put it into movie terms, that's like a movie genre. Yeah, but does everybody say, What genre is this? Yes. Oh, yeah. All the time. Why do they do that? It's like, you just say, is it a good story? That's what it should be. Yeah, but people want to know, is it a horror? Is it a comedy? I don't like horror movies. Bitch, you don't, you don't know. You don't even know what you don't, you don't know. even know what it is. They, they, they're, they're subgenre upon subgenre upon subgenre. Yes. That's a style. Let's talk about how it was made. Let's talk about the production value. Let's talk about everything yes. else. Yes. Okay. Um, did he literally lay this out alphabetically? That is redonkulously cool. Arc beam. The arch. Arch. Not arc. I don't know what you're looking at. A R C H. Arc. But why is it architect then? I was assuming you were going to say arch. Beam, brick, building, cable structure, ceiling, ceramic. Oh, Guys, then, I could do this all in, night. In that case, then that would be arch. Would be arch. So wh why is it? This is why I, I can't spell architect. A R C H I T E C T R E. Well, I, I would hope you could spell it, but. The et etymology of it means chief builder. Chief builder, mm -hmm. like the, the the main builder. Do you know what the etymology of filmmaker is? Mm -mm. Filmmaker, um, house oh, journey light low, <laughs> maze real piece. That's very poetic. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, that's what I bring to the table, man. <laughs> that and <laughs> strawberries and cream, Dr Pepper. It's <laughs> really all I got. And to this, go, this is pretty phenomenal. To, to bounce off of this, now this is like the Visual Dictionary of Architecture, and it talks about all the fancy things. You talk about like the hardware. They have different door hardware that's on here. How heating works. Uh, different types of metals. The membranes that they have on there. Like this. These are the simple things. Now this book. This is called Arc Arc Archie Speak. Whoa! Oh! This is so. This is when you're talking to clients and you want to have really fancy words like anchoring or blob master or materiality or trans programming or zoomorphic. Part T. So is the book that you use. I am a tremendously huge fan of Insider Speak. Insider Speak is like that uh, is this book for that, sure. that does, that's Insider Speak. Like one of my favorite Insider Speak things is waitress culture. Oh, 
<gasps> my wife talks about this. She knows all this stuff. Does she? I don't know she was any a, of them. She was a waitress and a bartender for 15 years. Oh, that would do it. She knows all of the words. Like slap it on a skillet and call it Tuesday. So uh, there's the diner stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I don't I don't know if the diner... The diner stuff, I think it's going to be different everywhere. It is. It's very yeah. colloquial. It's very like dependent on where it's at, mm -hmm. but some of them are universal. Vernacular, v yeah. Well, I mean, that's what it all boils down down to, mm -hmm. anyway. Is it's, it's, it's all vernacular. Um, like when I learned about film inside speech, man. Oh my god, I just get so excited. Like, I got some Gary Coleman's over there. I mean, it's it's all gatekeeping. It, it that that's what it is. It is all gatekeeping, and it's all yeah. it's all a pissing contest on who knows more. I had a Boy, professor kick someone out of class because they called the lights by their wattage names, which is how you buy them or rent them or use them. He said, "No, no one calls them by their wattage names, which is how you buy them, rent them, or use them." He says, "You use the old Hollywood speak." Every fucking production I've ever done since then, no one knows what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> but I had him kick a kid out of class because he was using the correct terminology. He sounds like an asshole. He was a giant asshole. Anyway, that was I fun. Tell me about Arcus Speed because this is so cool. So, I, I mean, this. this is just, it's, these are all of the super fancy words that you would want to use. Oh, here we go. Derive. Oddly enough. <gasps> Exactly what we were talking about before, and we've gone full circle. The universal callback. Oh my god, I love the, that. The Amber Gods just made that one oh, so. The Amber Gods. Dude, why don't we name the show Amber Gods or in tribute to the Amber Gods? Or maybe we should just like like do it. Because like we're a fat. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Buttertown. Oh, I I love Buttertown so much. Yeah. Like I was really against Butter Capital. But Buttertown, I wasn't against it. I just didn't care. But like Buttertown, I'm I'm there, man. Welcome to Buttertown. Because How can I take your order? No one's gonna have it. No one's gonna have that. Name. Buttertown. All right, hold on. Well, well, because now, this is good podcasting. Hey, hey, I'm looking up. Buttertown. We know what good podcasting. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Is. All right. Um, I am not good good at reading, man. And the light in here is designed to make me look shadowy, not. Right. I mean like, so, like Batman? Uh Gay Debard's text La Theory de la Derve was first published in nineteen fifty six in the Belgian surrealist journal La Lurvis News, defined as the technique of incarnation without a goal. That can't be right. Am I not reading incarnation without a goal? I don't think that there is a locomotion. Town. Locomotion without a goal. Yes, there's no goal. The the no goal thing is 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 fascinating to me. Yeah, which almost makes and you, me, like I said, you can get a Derive app, which makes me almost want to name the podcast Derive. I like guarantee that. Oh, exists. I guarantee it's too clever. There, um, I don't see a Buttertown podcast, but there is a <gasps> Buttertown song. Can we use it? It looks very old. It was, oh no! Shit, released in two thousand four. I guess it's so. It's very old, old as my very students would say. Old. Oh no! Oh, you know what? <laughs> There's a younger girl that I work with. It says she doesn't watch anything that's old. Anything before two thousand is old. Shut like, the front ah! door. It's like, why would I want to watch Matrix? That's old. <laughs> Someone said in in my class, like, "There's the I, I know it's 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 a joke upon joke. Every, every generation has this joke. We're we're not saying anything new to the masses." But when they, they said um, the classic film, and they, they, they meant classic as in like, you know, back in the old days of movies, uh, Breakfast Club. And I was like, I was alive when that came out. I was a cognizant human being. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you think about it, the 90s, now to the 90s is... The nineties to the sixties. Well, right, right. Oh, yeah. I I was reading something online the other day, and I don't remember the We're, math for it. Is but sixties. Like, Hold on. We are closer to the year twenty seventy or something like that than than we are to the seventies. I'm. I might be doing the math wrong. Actually, I think that math is right. Math is hard. This is why I don't do it. We don't do math in Buttertown. <laughs> 
I have a cell phone for Buttertown math, which I'm not going to look up because that's really good podcasting. Because podcasting, which brings us to Buttertown the book. Uh, Order your copy one? now. Nah, we don't want to talk about that one. Give me a second real quick. I just want to make, make sure that, that that's still going. Yeah. Golly. Um, oh, I think I think geez, the rest sorry. of these books. No, no, yeah, no. This one's cool. Haven't. Yeah. This one's Talk. cool. So this book is called Genius Loci. Oh. It's uh, Towards a Phenomenology of Architecture by Charles Norberg Schultz. Cool. This one's really, really good. Why does everyone have a cool name? Because I have to. I have to have a cool name. So this is a piggyback off of what was going on with Italio Calvino and uh, Gaston Bacler with Poets of Space. This is the phenomenology and kind of how architecture came to be. And I think more specifically, I am incredibly fascinated about the earlier chapters in this where they talk about how they talk about how location is where the, uh, you know, we're, I'm going to piss off all the listeners who believe in God. Um, Hey, if, if, the if I can't make art to piss people off, yeah. what's the point? So they're saying that essentially the uh, a, a monotheism yeah. came from the Middle East because in the Middle East, uh, visually, you can see incredibly far. Mm. There's not a lot to see. The ty- typography, right? You can see anything coming. The yeah, typography. There's no, there's no hidden spaces. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing like that. But at night, it's very dark there, and the sky is going to be incredibly vibrant there. Yeah. And they say that due to the visual acuity and the atmosphere, it makes sense. Genius loci means spirit of place. That. If there was going to be monotheism to grow anywhere, it would be in a place like a desert. Okay. Which is why the three big ones all came from like a, a massive desert region. Huh. Um, and polytheism, the locations where you had that, were places where you had, you know, lots of different types of places in one spot. Where like, you know, if you talk about like Greece, there's mountains. Mountains, and deserts. There's hollows. Yeah, there's ocean. And, and ocean. Yeah. And shallow water, deep water, and there's many, like if you were to say there's many types of gods there. Because you can't say, well, you know, there's a god of the deep water, there's a god of the shallow water, there's a god of the boggy areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a god of the forest, there's a god of the deep forest, there's a god of the top of that mountain with the lightning bolts. Right. And that's how you had the polytheistic gods came from those locations. What's a polytheistic? More than one, multi-gods. Isn't that what... Oh, 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 polytheist. I thought you said a uh, polyist. You, that's how a polyistic. Okay. Yeah. I thought I thought that was a third like type. Poly, m- m- uh, many gods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right, right, right. I thought, I thought, never mind. The, uh, the you know, the paganistic stuff. Yes. So yes. monotheism, like it, as far as I can see when I'm in the middle of a desert, you can see nothing but the one God who's up top. So that justifies one. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's something that I, and they talk about that in this book and they do talk about like hmm. multiple places and how, like a spirit, how like the again because it is phenomenology. It's how people take in space and how the individual does it, and and where you are as an individual can affect the way that you see things. And it is this is a very very cool book as well. I really like this one. They talk about all these different places and how because they were geographically how the architecture was derived there. Yeah, very very cool. And again. It is Genius Loci Towards the Phenomenology of Architecture by Tr- Christian Norberg Schultz. Uh, on that note, we're going to have all these books down in the description below. Feel free to check these out on Amazon. Thank you. And then the, the last one, I thought these were just like these little, these are like neat little guidebooks. I love books like this so much. These are, and again, I think this was another guy's master thesis, either huh. master thesis or a PhD. Um, is this, this is the same book, or is this just two of? Uh, I think he he did the one and it ended up doing really really well. So he did, so a, he did a, 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 a second part. Very cool. Um, this is operative design. With operative design, what the guy does is he takes every shape of space that you could have, 
and he he names everything. Again, we're going back to the the naming of things. Like you could have a box or all these things. Yeah. And once you name them, you can start <gasps> naming spaces. No way. You can start naming spaces and the types of shapes that they would make based off of the names. And like if you keep going through that, it's it's actually it's really really cool on how the different ways on how you can make space once you start like identifying them. I, it, it's it's really really cool. So th- this this is like genius level Tetris. Yes, that would be like genius level Tetris. Oh my god! You know, and just just so you know, like when when Jay's looking at it, like you'll take a book it's, or you take like a box, yeah, and it's like, well, what happens? What happens if you have a box with a little box next to it? And what happens if you have a box that has that is split in the middle, a slightly different angle? And, and what happens if you have a slightly like wow? And by like a notch, yeah, if you have a notch space. But the thing is, is you you think mm, that you can, well you know there's an infinite amount of combinations of things but right. if you you know broadly define what a notch is or broadly define what and then you have subgenres yeah of I, the notch. then you have yeah so you have subgenres of the notch or subgenres of the smaller box or the subgenres split, and split yeah the split and split is a cool one yeah do you know all these like uh, I've I've gone through it 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 can it like, can help if you are when you're designing a building. And you kind of, I like to go through these really quick before I design a building in case I want to pull something out of my yeah, I get that out of my hat yeah, it's um, like having magic tricks right yeah. ready to go. Like some of these spaces are going to cost more than others, uh, of course. But um, but sometimes you can be in these unique situations where you have to like, what can I do to make this as affordable as possible, and makes it as much of a dynamic space as I can. Nest. Uh, and it's incredibly. You were talking about that. Uh, yeah, nest. That's yeah. the box in a box. Yeah. Oh, like a nesting. Yeah, but well, nesting. So I remember when I was talking to uh, the the head designer right now. He said, "If there's if there's one thing I could tell anybody if they're going to design anything, he said, d- uh, design things for nesting. If you design any space oh. where it lo- where it's, if you design any space where it you have." Um, any sort of like defensive or nesting things to it, mm. anybody's gonna like it. Like a room is gonna have closed doors. Rooms have closed oh, doors. Like I nobody's see, ever gonna have a room that doesn't have closed doors. Nobody's gonna want a house that's completely gonna be open on the side. Nobody wants well, a basement where anybody can get out of. Correct. Nobody like and everybody wants to be able to like if you're up high, people love being able to see when they're up high, but they don't want to be seen when oh. they're up high. Unless you want to be seen to be right. seen as uh, you know as powerful. I thought you said if you're a pie, and I was like, I would like to be a cherry pie. If I gave you like a pen and paper, and I like gave you homework, like you, do you think you could do these, like off your off your dome? Could do you think you could like recreate these? If I told 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 you the name, I'm not gonna make you do it. I was just wondering if, like, how much of this is ingrained in you versus how much uh, is it? these, the way that I, these seem real specific. So, I I'm very much in the same vein as uh, as uh, Doctor Jones, <laughs> uh, senior, not junior. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Where he, he <laughs> you writes him, everything down. I write everything down so I don't have to remember. <laughs> that's right. I have these books so I don't have to remember. No, them. I get that. And the other thing that's like. Uh, a huge reason why I love books is that I don't remember all this stuff. It's almost, yeah. I don't remember it until I look at the book, and then all of a sudden my brain gets flooded with everything that's inside the book. Really? I just have to, I just have to look at it, but like I can't like take the volume off the shelf. You ever notice like when you're with a group of people and you're telling jokes and you mm. don't remember any of your jokes until other people tell jokes? In a hundred percent, yeah. Or you right. don't know any good stories until other people start telling Correct. stories. Correct. I love having my and I have hundreds of books at home. I have all my books in my office because I simply need to just look at the bookshelf and it, then I instantly kind of Really? It connects re- that yeah, I just look at the once I look at the cover, and I just go okay. And That's I remember remarkable. Again. And everything just kind of floods back real quick. But you, then, like in like I, I'd forget it in like a couple of days, and it's gone again. Do you do that with everything, or is it like book specific? 
it's book specific and I have to group all the books according to the way that I think. That's what I was going to lead to next. How do you organize your bookshelf? The um I guess it would be like in thought topics. Okay, okay. So D- I have like I have this, I yeah. have like I have like a technical book section. Okay, okay. I have a drawing book section and a graphics section. Yeah. I have a like a, a s- sociology kind of section that I have. Okay. I have a theory section. I have an individual books like individual architect section. Like a specific author or yeah, specific if I have like type a, of architect. If I have a if I have a, something where it's just an individual architect. I just put all those. Together. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, I have a section of a like the thumb through section. Mm. Like the I need like ideas. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have one of those. I, I really like those a lot. I bet. Um, I do have a whole. There's a lot of reference things. I would put this would be under a reference. Yeah, yeah. Like these. Would the be arch- under, yeah, these would be under a reference. Um. Sociology. Everything that I had for my thesis, I have in one section. Like Do you really? Whole, I group them in like a kind of a circle. Either has to be, since it's all done in boxes, it's in one box mm. or it has to be next to the box. And the thing is, is when I look at it, and then I know when I think of one thing, it ties everything to that area. Yep. So I know how that I rem- when I look at one book, it'll be like, oh, I remember all these other books, and they're just right yep. there. Yep. I have to look at it. So I love that. I love how we correlate our own little categories. Yeah. So everything has to be done in a very particular way. So yeah, every time that I moved, I would have to box up like I'd have like twenty or thirty boxes of books. Yeah. So everything has to go on the shelf, but then like, and then it would take me like it. a couple months yep, to like yep. finally get to the point where I organize it so I can actually look at it again. <laughs> but I'll just sit there and I'll just stare at my bookshelf. I'm like, why are all these things down there? And it just it kills me when something I'm like, this should be right here. And I just get super upset, and I'm like, I know you're supposed to be right there, and I'm mad that it's not there. Really? I was like that with DVDs, too. The categorization's too important, man. Yeah, I don't have to, like, I don't know. It's just the way that your brain thinks. Mm -hmm. And the reference books all have to be within arm's reach. Well, uh, that makes complete sense, because in case you need that knowledge, I need it now. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I love... Man, there... I, I think it harks back to like working at a CD store, work, working at Tower Records. I love organization and subcategories. Like one of my favorite things to do now is to make Excel spreadsheets because I'll make like the first one or Google spreadsheets. I'll make the first one and then I have 50 tabs <laughs> with like specific needs. And one thing like a tab might only have one piece of information, but I know where it's at. Because I have that shit organized. And I have it organized by production or how I use them. Where it's like, if I'm doing a video, if I'm making a video, I know conceptual is going to be first. Second is going to be pre-production. But pre-production branches off into 12 other different aspects too. <laughs> so it's like, when you when you have yourself categorized, like if I were to give that to anyone else, they would think I was a fucking lunatic. But like, it makes sense to me. And that, that's how my brain works. I have to work in order. Like, um, I have I have pretty bad ADD, uh, so much so that I can't do anything in the morning until I make a list of the shit I have to do during the day. And then if I don't do one of those things, I panic. So it's like... How do you go on vacation? It's I haven't in a very long time. And when, when we do, I have to make, make lists. You make a list of what you're going to do on vacation? Not like or the specific, day but it's like, hey, we're going to this place today. I want to have lunch. And sometimes the list can be super stupid simple, but it makes me feel like I'm accomplishing something when I don't have the list of things to do. You know, there's a lot of people that love you very much. <laughs> there's a lot of people who love you very much. And everybody <laughs> always says, I would like to hang out with Jay. But I know that I can't stop by. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Because it's very obvious that there's a a monkey wrench going yeah. on if somebody just drops by, and that you have to schedule to yep. hang out with you. I thought I was just a curmudgeon for a long time, and after I got tested and I started like doing all the research on this, yeah, that that that's why I feel like my day is a failure. I there, feel like there are I, so many arguments that yeah. you and I have ever, have had. Yep. 
and everything makes so much sense. Yep. Because I'm just like, let's yeah. drive to Alaska. <laughs> You're like, but I, I can't do the, My buddy Fredo did that, I, which I think is really, really amazing. He drove to Alaska? Yeah, him and just another guy just drove to Alaska. That is day. literally on my bucket list. We, he, no, they didn't plan for it at all. Uh-huh. They literally just woke up and were like, hey, we got two weeks. Oh, my God. You want to drive to Alaska? Okay. And then they did. That sends shivers of fear down my spine. Oh, my God. I love it. Um, and, and you've always been that way. You know, and you've always called it city mouse versus country mouse. And I don't know who's who. because we ever call it doesn't, city doesn't, mouse? Oh, you used to say it all the time, 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 time to me. I was probably the the city mouse or the country mouse. I see, see, and I think about it. I'm like, isn't the city mouse the one one that wants to go out all the time? Well, yeah, well, I, I go out to Alaska. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I would love to go out to Alaska. Oh my god, Alaska is amazing. And if I have money, I'm retiring there, no question. I like that they have ranked choice voting there. I wish the rest. I don't of the know Mac what that is. That. What is that? Ranked choice voting is where you. You don't vote for one person. You vote for like who you like from best to worst. <gasps> oh, I love that. I love that. And then you often, like everybody kind of gets what they want. I, I, I get to vote my opinion on people. <laughs> yeah. And say, you are the worst of these choices. That is so what I love to do, John. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I yeah. do that for fun now. But when, when you do that, like you end up getting everybody kind of, you might not get your number one, but you might get number two. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, right, which right. Which is, you know, way better than what we usually get now. Well, I mean, it's like, so I go to Gen Con. Well, I haven't been to Gen Con in a long time, but it, it's a board board game convention, and you have to sign up months in advance to play the games you want to play in the time slots you want to play, play them, and you still might not get it. So it's a lottery system. So, like, if I have a... Wait, just to play the game? Yeah. Oh so God. if 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 I... Because so many people go, they have to do it this way. It is... You don't realize how many people are there it's, until it's, you're It's there. a lottery? Kind of, yeah. Mm. It's... um You build your schedule, and then you hit go. And well, how do you know what gives, games you're going to play? They give a, uh, like, a giant online dictionary of time slots, games, everything else. Like months and like a month. month yeah, but in if advanced. you've never played the game before, how do you know how long? Or does it say how long it's going to? Yeah, take? yeah, yeah. They, they give you like okay, this game will take an hour. This game will take like four hours. What, what, whatever else. Man. Yeah, but what they do is that, and then you make your like top three choices for each time slot. I see. Okay. And then you might not get your first one, but chances are you yep. might you might get, that is, get one. That's ranked choice voting. Yeah, I, I love that. And I I hated it the first year I went until you see how many people are actually there and how 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 chaotic it can get very easily. No, I'm very happy with how they do things. It sucks, but do you get bored with this stuff really easy in like, life? I, I, or? I can't. I guess both, but I uh, yeah in life. But like, God, can you imagine like you're like this is the game I'm gonna play and it and it sucks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 it, it took me a long time to understand this philosophy, but my friend Carmi told it to me. And it sounds stupid, simple, but if you don't like something, leave. Like, there's no reason you should stay. For anything? Well, I mean, I understand there's social obligations. Yeah, yeah. But, like, I'm not saying, like, oh, the first five minutes of this movie was stupid, I'm I'm out. I mean, that's kind of shallow. But I went to a game, it was described as one thing. It was described as a Harry Potter role-playing game. So I was excited. I wanted to try it. And um, I sat down, and the DM sat down. And it's like, this is my game. You know, I designed this, which is really cool because you get to play, like, with the game designers. It's, it's kind of cool because mm-hmm. they're there to test it, too. Okay. So if we break something, they're like, oh, cool, now I can fix that. Okay. You know? So... And sometimes you get to play games that are like no one's ever heard of, which one of my favorite all time games I played that way. The guy was testing it there. And like I, I jumped on the Kickstarter, fucking love it. It's one of my favorite games. Is this is the one you and I played with the jewels? Yes. I love that game. Right? Like it's it's simple, but it's like it's really thought provoking. It is. I love it. I love it's and stupid easy. Yeah. Stupid easy is like this box turns now. But, that but it's could, so much but fun. But you can do so many things with it. It's you can do so, so many things. things. Yes. What's the name of it again? I don't know, and I always forget a- it. Ap- um, Apothecary? Ap- ap- apothecary. Apothecary. Yes, Apothecary. I've you, looked it up you online. You can't find it. You can, they're online. You can find it used. 
Yeah, you can find it used. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would take it used. Oh, no, no, no. But the price, like, if you can find it cheap, oh, my God, buy it. When we were looking for friends for, for copies for friends, yeah. it was in the $100 a copy. And we're like, we, we can't do, do that. That's yeah. ridiculous. Super fun game. It's a super, anyway, so I sat down. We're playing Harry Potter role-playing game. And I was like, cool, what's the rules? And he goes, oh, uh, I'll just ask you what you want to do. And I was like, part of role playing to me is some restrictions. Because if I go, if I have end all be all. I'm God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm Dumbledore and I win the game of Harry Potter. So we basically had to choose characters really quick. Everyone chose, you know, I'm Harry, I'm Haran. And I was like, I want a no name character. Because I don't want to be part of this like legacy of already known story. I want something original. So and everyone looked at me like I was fucking like weird. So um, w- he just went around the table. It's like, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? And he got to me, and I was like, I really want to go investigate. Blah blah blah. And everyone looked at me and says, That's not what your character would do. I was like, You don't even fucking know me. I'm playing a no name character. And they got, they were pissed at me. Did you get up and leave? No, and I should have. And that was like the final straw. I told my, my my friends this story. I sat there for an hour, just not giving a shit. Like after a while, I got a little vindic- vindictive because everyone was against me. I, I wasn't trying to be a dick at all. Do you know these people? Not at all. You're everyone like, you're was like a super nice guy. You're like, and that's it. Is you're I, a you're a living ginger I, teddy bear. <laughs> I like bringing fun to these games. I like doing voices and like creating stories and shit like that. And I, I'll 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 typically like pull back if if I'm going too far and I know the table's not enjoying it. I'll be like, okay, you know, I want everyone to have a good good time regardless but of the game I'm playing. Because they were they were being dicks. But because they were being dicks, I was like, okay, this sucks. This is terrible. Who who were you playing with? I don't know. Just a bunch, bunch of people. You're I, by I don't yourself. Know. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, adverse to that, that same day, I was in the Munchkin World tur- tur- Tournament, <gasps> and um, we were not the final. We were the sub final, whatever that is. Like we were quarterfinal. Whoever won this went on to do 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 the final, and everyone sitting at the table was so fucking cool. We were just sitting around the table. Like you were allowed to bring any power ups because Munchkin is very it, 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 it's a card game known for having additional power ups like there's a cookie and if you bite the cookie you get a free revival you know if you have pins each pin allows you to have plus one attack genius marketing it's genius it's beyond genius marketing so this guy shows up with a briefcase filled to the brim with stuff and all of it's like way out, out of print, super rare promos, you know, and he's like, I'm going to kick all your asses. Like he didn't say that, but like you saw it on his face. He's like, mm-hmm. Is that the look of kicking? Well, at a game table, you know. I thought it was having like a lot of butt crack showing. <laughs> that was that one. A lot of the guy crack. who got kicked out of all the, <laughs> he got kicked out of all the Magic the Gathering. Uh, <laughs> Things because he he kept posing like this next to like a bunch of butt cracks. Look, at, oh, I remember that. And the guy was like a huge fan, but it was oh, that's super right. funny. You're like I would have been honored if he posed by my butt. Right, crack. I would have like, like put dude, that, that on is the... my butt crack. Dude, that's the butt crack guy. Yeah. Uh, so like we all decided because uh, every everyone was cool playing the game. We all decided you know like hey let's not do promos. Let's just play this like original like and have fun. And he was pissed. He was like, no, I'm gonna play as many as I want. And um, the rule at tournament is you can have one more than anybody else. So if everyone else has four, you can have five. If everyone else has three, you can have four. So whoever has the most, someone else can have one more. Okay? So we all said no. So he chose one. And basically, we didn't say a word. Like, because there's eight of us playing. Seven of us all kind of looked at each other and kicked him out the first round. (laughs) Like he lost. He lost. Like like we just destroyed him. It's like you're out. Yeah. And then we had a five hour game. It was slotted for one hour. I missed my next couple games because we played for five hours. All the GMs were coming over watching. They're like, just win. We're like, no, we're having a blast. So like the GMs came over and just started shooting the shit with us. It was really fun. Um, 
It, it was a fucking blast. It was one of the best games I've ev ever played. Because what we did, like everyone would get up to level nine and everyone would fucking die. <laughs> and everyone would get up to level nine and we all die. It was it was just fantastic. That was just karma for the other shitty game. Yeah, yeah. And that, 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 that that's how I took it, is that, that day super balanced out on the side of good. Yeah. But because if you don't like something. Because good is dumb. Because <laughs> good is dumb. That movie does not hold up. No? No. Well, it is. It Mel is. Brooks is kind of man. Mel, oh, this stuff doesn't hold up too well. I went back and watched a lot of Mel Brooks recently, uh, because I because I watched Spaceballs and I was like, like life stinks. Uh, life stinks. Is it life stinks or love uh, love stinks? I don't know that one. I don't know that one. That one was fun. Or is it life? Or is it maybe it's a super? No, I think it's love stinks. I don't know. I I've, I've never heard of that one. Yeah, it was a funny one. I went. I went. I watched uh, Young Frankenstein. I watched Blazing Saddles. I watched um, History of the World Part One, which, by the way, there's a TV show for Part Two right now. So I heard, you, you know, I've never seen Part One. I've never seen History of the World. It's not bad. In in the seventies, yeah, it was probably funny. It's okay. I mean, the the the, the problem with Mel Brooks is he, he he's, he's not a storyteller. He's a gag teller. He is a gag teller. He's like this joke happens, and then this joke. How do we get from this set to up, this? Set up and punchline. He's a set up and punchline. That's it. Yeah. And that's why Spaceballs doesn't work because I don't give a shit about anybody well, in the, the movie. The real, if they're like real, um, like tied to that time and mm. stuff. But then again, you know what? Like Looney Tunes did that. Looney Tunes is super funny. I love Looney Tunes. I, and I still think that holds up. Can you watch it today and be emotionally involved with it? Though? Looney Tunes? Yeah. If I was watching... Or do you just watch it and go, ha ha, and then go back no, to doing some, no, something else? No, absolutely not. It, it, for one in particular, this is the one where everybody learned about opera. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> Look, what have I done? I killed a rabbit. Oh, the bunny. Oh, the rabbit. That episode scarred me because I thought every episode. Spearway Magic cool. Helmet. Spirit oh. Magic Helmet. Spearway Magic Helmet. Yeah, I do. I love that one. I love that one a bunch. And they had the big chubby horses. You're 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 literally talking about one episode. <laughs> yeah, but it's amazing. I'm not I'm not disregarding. There's a lot that. of good ones. No, they're 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 almost all amazing. All the old ones. I will say the older ones are far better. That's that once they like the sixties, the sixties, and that was the old ones. Sixties and seventies, the ones where they were like just doing like the weird music and nobody was talking. Oh no 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 no! That's like oh no! Well, hold on, no, I'm thinking Tom and Jerry. That's Tom and Jerry. The old, the the newer Tom and Jerry were really weird. Tom and Jerry and like early Text a Avery, early no, like Hanna I Barbera totally... maybe. No, Hanna Barbera was always talking. I stand by it. All like old Disney and old Looney Tunes were freaking hilarious. Disney, old Disney, especially Donald Duck. I love Donald Duck, especially the one where he was a Nazi. He, yeah, I mean, he was. He did have the little mustache going on there. Donald Duck was the funniest one, dude. He saluted. <laughs> like I remember, he jumped out of bed and saluted the flag. And I remember, even as a kid, I was like, "You gotta have a bad guy." Hmm. Donald Duck was arguably the. I guess. He oh, was he the was guy. the bad guy. Yeah, obviously, he he was the anti-hero. Well, they did have the big chubby cat too. Who kind of he looked like Disney? Yeah, Pete, Pistol Pete. Oh, that's not no. Pete was a dog. He was Goofy's arch ne nemesis. But he looked like a cross in between a cat and a dog. Well, I mean, granted, we don't know what they are because it's not technically a dog. But yeah, they they are kind of a dog hybrid thing. I never really thought about it. I guess Goofy. God, because Pluto was a dog. Pluto was definitely a dog. And we're about to say something that every fucking comedian has ever said. In the basement of their home, because it's not that funny. What the fuck was Goofy? Pluto was a dog. What the fuck was Goofy? He had that Italian bread nose. What did you think? I don't know. I, he probably was racist. <laughs> Roy Disney was pretty racist uh, himself. That's that's a no fucking brainer watching What's old Disney? Disney. What 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 name is Disney? Disney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm saying like... Oh. Is Disney like Italian? Like, or like... Is that Italian? I don't know. This, this podcast is getting real good, though. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's... What What nationality is Disney? How does, na how does nationality... 
According to Genius Loci. That's what I'm talking about, yeah. According to Genius Loci, yeah. well, the way where where you're from is going to frame a lot of the ways that you see things. And if Disney... So if we can turn, where turn did, this around. Where did Disney come from? And I wonder... Because, Walt- like, Walter Disney... You just got to say, like, you know, if you were from Korea, Korean people don't like Japanese people. Japanese people didn't like a lot of other people. Chinese people definitely didn't like Japanese people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's the, like, Russians hated everybody. <laughs> they still do. Uh, he was born in Chicago. Well, Disney's from Chicago. Well, his dad was a, his dad was a, a furniture maker. I'm looking for it. Uh, December 5th, 1901, Chicago. Yeah, but his dad, yeah, his dad was a furniture maker. I do remember that, but like, what nationality? That's is what I'm looking Disney? for. Uh, Trip Avenue, Chicago Hermosa neighborhood. I've never heard of Hermosa. Um, Irish. Disney's Irish. Irish, which kind of makes sense. He's probably from. The, it's probably the southwest side then, right? Of oh, no, Chicago. No, was, I guess that was Italian. Oh shit! I I I, I don't I don't know. The boroughs of Chicago. The five fist. Mm. Whatever that fucking horrible rap analogy is about New York. That was from uh Gangs of New York. No, there was yeah. there was a there was a rap dude who said that oh, dude. before that. That was that was uh like Queens Brooklyn. I got the five corners and every single corner it's like a fist. I turn it in my fist for my hand, and I could do. Oh, was that I Bill want. the Butcher? It was Bill the Butcher that said that. Hand, hands down, one of the greatest fucking cinematic oh, villains. I, I would love to be Bill the Butcher when I grow up. Right? I love Bill the Butcher. That's that was also a book that I w- that I would love to read. The Gangs of New York. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it was a series of multiple short stories that. Oh, um, see, that sounds interesting. And I and when you kind of see it, that's kind of what it feels like. It's multiple short stories, right? And I the love bullshit in the middle. I just, I just, I understand. It's a uh, we're getting into to movies here, which is not what this episode's about. But yes, uh, about anything. <laughs> this is Buttertown, man. Because this is Buttertown. It's all butter. It's all butter. But thank you. I, I mean, quite legitimately, thank you for. Uh, Bringing all these over, like, 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 if 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 there's one thing I know that like you collect besides dinosaur shit and rocks, which is essentially the same thing, um, I know you're a giant fan of books. So you sharing this with me is like, like architecture, art, theory, critical thinking books. Um, this is like seen into your per, per personal life, and this is really enjoyable. Thank you. Maybe this is what we do. Maybe next week you literally because this is essentially. Because our wives don't give a shit about what we what we like. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. I love you, babe. But I know, I know. Uh, I get. To, I will talk to Jay about this stuff, so I don't have to bother you. <laughs> nice, nice little rib- ribbon on the yeah. end there. But because you know, this is like show and tell. Like yeah. look at these cool things that nobody else cares about. Yeah, that's true. So I think next week, I'll bring something. I already have your, some, something in mind. Yeah, bring bring your stuff down here and just yeah. tell me tell me some cool shit that you like. It's a little bit easier. You for, know why? Because. Cause this is fucking butter town. This is fucking butter town, man. Everything's butter town. Do you have a better way to end it? Butter. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>